It's that time again. Villain for all seasons. Episode 11. What up, y'all? I'm Dan. I'm Ben. This is a joke on John Oliver that I've been thinking about because our episodes are always so late. And it's, it's just because we are lazy people and record when we want to record. But um, last fortnight tonight. <laughs> Four score and nights tonight. Yeah. yeah. Today. Because you probably listen to this in the day. Yeah. Two week I, old. News. I don't know. I think we're good late night listening if you wanted to. Yeah. And I mean, I, I hope that the people are following. I don't think political junkies are following us because they, they know everything, right? Yeah. Not yet. We're, we're out here speaking to you lay people. Yeah. Shout exactly. out to the lay people. Shout out to the lay people. Yes. What up? Um, and on that note, we're going to be talking about Pizza Gates, Met Gates um, doing, doing horrible, terrible things to a 17 year old, multiple 17 year olds. From what it sounds like yeah that's a uh, peeling an onion this story should we should we start there should we just start with i yeah yeah i'm just going to to read i just i just want to make sure that i get all the details right because this is the courtroom so i'm just going to read this a little bit of this new york times article so it says the matt gates investigation what we know uh, the justice department is said to be investigating the congressman's encounters with women recruited online for sex and whether he had sex with a 17 year old girl so two things there, encounters with women recruited online for sex and whether he had sex with a 17-year-old girl. And I'm just going to repeat again, uh, kind of give you a summary. It says, the Justice Department is investigating whether Representative Matt Gates, Representative Florida, and a close ally of former President Donald J. Trump broke federal sex trafficking laws, focusing on his relationships with women recruited online for sex and whether he had sex with a 17-year-old girl. Investigators appear to be focused on at least two key questions. According to people briefed on their work, the first is whether Matt Gates, 38, had sex with a 17-year-old and whether she received any material value. More broadly, federal authorities are scrutinizing involvement by the congressman and an indicted for to associate with the women who also received cash payments. Um, and the, I just want to give you a few more little quotes here. Matt Gates, a third-term congressman who represents the Florida panhandle, has denied that he paid for sex or had a sexual re relationship with a minor. So, so far, he has not been charged and the extent of his criminal exposure remains unclear. The investigation is continuing. Um, and I just wanted to note two things that stood out to me in this explosive, explosive, using cliches, uh, article that came out in the New York Times. Um, so here's one that, that got me. Um, in encounters during 2019 and 2020, Matt Gates and Mr. Greenberg, which was the Ford associate that was mentioned before, uh, instructed the women to meet at certain times and places, often at hotels around Florida, and would tell them the amount of money they were willing to pay, according to messages and interviews. One person said that the men also paid in cash, some sometimes withdrawn from a hotel ATM. Some of the men and women took ecstasy, an Ill illegal mood-altering drug, before having sex, including Mr. Gates, two people familiar with the encounter said. Um, in some cases, Mr. Gates asked, asked women to help find others who might be interested in having sex with him and his friends, according to two people familiar with these, those conversations. Should anyone inquire about the relationships, one person said, Mr. Gates told the women to say that he had paid for hotel rooms and dinner as part of their dates. And I think there's one, one more section. Um, the, the just, this is about the, the other other things that he's in trouble for. Um, the Justice Department inquiry is also examining whether Mr. Gates had sex with the 17 year old girl and whether she received anything of material value, according to four people familiar with the investigation. The sex trafficking count against Mr. Greenberg involved the same girl, according to two people briefed on the investigation. Um, actually, I think that's a good place to stop. Uh, ben, what'd you think about all this? Yeah, I love this story. Um, I. <laughs> I don't, uh, obviously I don't condone uh, sex with minors or the, uh, I guess, uh, well, they're calling it like trafficking because basically he was, uh, part of the accusation is that uh, technically if you're paying to fly someone over state lines for sex, that can be uh, considered trafficking. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, I've, I've loved this mostly from, I haven't, I haven't kept up with it since it, since it first dropped last week, but like the first thing I saw of it was right after it broke tucker carlson had him on his show like that day right right um and you could really t i watched that segment of it tucker carlson's clearly going in blind you know and i don't know what his reasoning for it was i guess it's probably part of tucker's mo to just kind of i, I think he thought he was helping out a friend 
Yeah, exactly. I think yeah, any yeah. anytime um, anytime there's someone on the right who's uh, in trouble or whatever, I think Tucker's like, you know what, I'm gonna let you get ahead of this or whatever. Yeah. And like, M- Gates could not have performed more poorly. I mean, I can't I can't summarize the whole thing for you. But it was just this weird, it was this weird blundering thing. So he says that actually this is part, if memory serves, he says that, well, this is actually this, like the Department of Justice investigation of him was like a political hit job um, on the right, even though, of course, it started under the Trump Justice Department. Yeah. And then he, yeah, and then he goes on to, and Tucker, like Tucker is visibly confused as this is going on like just like he's keep you know trying to keep a cool face or whatever but visibly like what the fuck are you talking about dude yeah uh and he's kind of like he's trying he's really trying his best to help him he's like uh, okay yeah. i don't see how well you know and i i don't know i can't speak to that whatever and he bring you know so gates brings up like He's like, you know, you yourself, Tucker, no person. And you can tell the second he's like, and Tucker, you know, and he, you can see it on Carlson's face where he's just like, please, God, don't bring me into this. Uh, he's like, you know yourself uh, how horrible it is to be convicted of uh, sexual abuse or like, you know, sexual assault or whatever allegations against you that are false. And I didn't know this story about Tucker Carlson, but he jumps in and he's like, you know, just to be clear, that was an that was an issue from 20 years ago where a a mentally ill fan of his made accusations and it was proven to be like categorically false. And he was like, so basically, t- <laughs> basically, Tucker tried to be like, we're not the same, bro. Different thing entirely. Yeah. And then later on, he's he's like well and you know tucker you remember from a a dinner i was having with you and your lovely wife and tucker again has to go in and be like uh just to be clear i do not remember this dinner at all and to say it looked bad for gates i don't think does it justice because it was just like what the fuck are you he threw like 40 details that none none of it seems to add up to anything and even after after he got off uh, the call with him and it just goes back to Tucker Carlson he's like well that has to be one of the weirdest interviews I've ever conducted yeah <laughs> and it just like yeah I I was trying to follow the story closely for a while um, and there's be- you know there's other uh, there's other people who can break it down better than me obviously but like the the more you follow it the uh, yeah it just keeps getting weirder like there does seem to be some sort of possibly extortion thing and then he's also trying he's also trying to put like put on the thing of like well this is just uh the left trying to demonize him i don't know why yeah yeah, it's like a completely convoluted weird story that you know it it sort of reminded me of um it's reminded me of every time Kevin Spacey has spoken up in the last several years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, it's like, dude, shut up. Like (laughs) you, do you remember when he issued his first statement after he got the allegations against him by the young actor where he's like, he's like, I choose, like I've had relationships with both men and women. I choose to live as a gay man now. And it was like, Whoa. Yeah. That's how he came out. That was his coming out. Uh, Yeah. In a, in a Kaiser Soze type way. (laughs) uh i turns out i'm gay too and we're going to equate being gay with uh you know molesting minors I, great I, job I, kevin spacey be, before you go on did you see the um the like christmas videos that he did as Frank yeah as did? they Man. were fucking weird they yeah. were really weird of him if by the way listener if you haven't seen him you gotta look it up it, it's a true nobody asked for this but it is the that. it yeah, is the seriously. ultimate nobody asked for this yeah but i think it's just a you know it goes yeah it goes back to uh like when the when the spacey stuff came out i was like who the fuck is your pr person because they must be watching there's no way he consulted anybody on this stuff right there's I, no way he no way he went to his manager and was like all right here's my idea yeah, there there had to be no like green lighting process. I'm going to I'm going to chop carrots and speak as my character that I got kicked off a show of. Killed off. Yeah, killed off. Well, after And he yeah. hinted at coming back. Yeah, I hinted at coming back. It was just like it was like, dude, 
my main point is whether or not Gates is guilty of this stuff, he probably is, right? I mean, all of these people are fucking perverts. Yeah, apparently um, Fox and well, it sounds like he was going to take a job at Newsmax. So this is this is actually news that broke six days ago, which yeah. I think no, no, sorry, the Newsmax broke like him re him retiring and taking a news job, like a contributor job at Fox or Newsmax or whatever or Newsmax or whatever broke six days ago. And I want to say that was an attempt to get out of this, get in front of the story before it broke. Yeah. Or at least like sign a contract before this broke. But yeah, no. Um, Should have just done that. Yeah. Yeah. Fox I'm, said that they want nothing to do with him. Yeah. So, well, duh. Of course. Well, well, what I'm saying though, it's like, it even shows that they have no faith. Like this is, he's probably going to go down. Yeah. He's probably going to go down. But again, my main point is just like, if you're in these situations, sometimes the best thing to do is shut the fuck up and like hope it blows over because every appearance he's done and every, like it has just made it so much worse and yeah i mean again he's probably guilty um because as we know all of these politicians and powerful people are perverts especially in florida hashtag epstein yeah hashtag I, pizza gates i can't remember was he part of the QAnon conspiracy crew oh i don't know i mean i know he's like a trump good disguise fan, but Good disguise. <laughs> got us. Um, oh, got well, us. I mean, it even he's he's got to be guilty. We we even talked about this in the the pre-show that the media headline is Matt Gates defiantly blames DC swamp quote unquote in media for sex trafficking allegations, and then I am quote not a monk unquote. Oh yeah, not a monk. Not a hey, monk. I'm not a monk. <laughs> I like to get mine too. I guess I, mean, he's saying, I think I know what it means, but what do you think it means? I well, I, I think I know what it means. It's like it's like, hey, look, this is bullshit. Do I like to fuck? Of course I like to fuck. <laughs> That's what I'm not a monk means. Yeah. Yeah. Someone any by the way, just if anybody ever says, Hey, look, I'm not a monk, that means they've done some gross shit. That's what <laughs> that's what that, that's what that's code for. <laughs> I'm not a monk equals I'm a pervert. <laughs> There's no in between. <laughs> yeah, he, I don't know. I mean, he sounds every, every, every like little bit that comes out of it. I'm like, yeah, you're probably fucking guilty, dude. And I then, did. yeah, it's just like the, the swamp stuff is so funny. Cause again, this is like a recurring theme on this show of talking about people trying to play the Trump handbook, you know, trying to troll like him, trying to make jokes like him. And yeah. I, it's just, it should be abundantly clear by now there's only one goat and it doesn't work for anybody else. Like these, yeah. like these defenses, well, and also, you know, mixed messaging aside, it's like, okay, it's the DC swamp and I'm getting extorted for millions of dollars of my family's money, but it's also the swamp. And uh, I don't know. I think, yeah, I think he's going to go down from from everything I understand. He's sort of he's sort of similar to a Cuomo type figure in the right. Like nobody fucking likes him, yeah. which is why you don't see anybody coming to his aid. And like, I mean, of course, Fox wouldn't. It's like, yo, bro, we've had m enough sex scandals over the last few years. Like, we're not touching this, you know, he looks obnoxious. Oh, yeah, he's he looks he looks like a pervert. Um, I wanted to highlight this one part about his father that was just so weird to me, but uh, it, it really does add another dimension to the scandal. Um, I'm just going to read direct, directly from the New York Times article. It says, Mr. Gates has sought to divert attention from the Justice Department investigation by claiming that he and his father were targets of an extortion plot by two men trying to secure funding for a s separate venture. The men, Robert Kent, a former Air Force intelligence officer who runs a consulting business, and Stephen Alford, a real estate developer who had been convicted of fraud, approached Mr. Gates's father, Don Gates, about funding their efforts to locate Robert A. Levinson, an American hostage held in Iran. They suggested to Don Gates that Mr. Levinson's successful return could somehow be used to secure a pardon for Matt Gates if he were charged with federal crimes, according to a copy of their proposal provided to the New York Times. Soon after, Don Gates, soon after, Don Gates hired a lawyer and contacted the FBI. Matt Gates said his father wore a wire and taped a meeting in a telephone conversation with Mr. Alford. An email exchange between Don Gates' lawyer and the Justice Department provided to the Times appears to confirm he was generally cooperating with the FBI as a looking to his claims. Of course, and Mr. Gates or Mr. Kent denied Gates' assertions and says, he goes, I told him I'm not trying to 
extort, but if this were true, he might be interested in doing something good. This guy totally did it. Um, <laughs> and then, and yeah, then, I... yeah, yeah. If, for those of you who don't know this, this is just a quick aside about uh, Robert Levinson. Um, last, and I'm going to quote again from the article. Last year, the Trump administration notified the family of Mr. Levinson, a former FBI agent, that he, that he, a former FBI agent, that he had died while in captivity in Iran, where he disappeared in 2007 while on unauthorized mission for the CIA. Um, but and then it goes on to say, but some people involved with the Levinson case continue to believe that he might still be alive, including Mr. Kent. Yeah, weird to mention about the whole thing, but I, again, I think it 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 only proves how guilty he is. Yeah, it's this is why like I, I was really enjoying following this story at first, and then I kind of got got a little exhausted by it because for a story that is so fucking dumb, there are a lot of moving parts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's dizzying i i am interested to hear what happens oh yeah i can't wait i'm loving these updates yeah so stay tuned we'll uh we'll keep you we'll keep you updated on pizza gates i hashtag pizza gates is this the first time you heard about him and i asked that because it's the first time i learned how to accurately pronounce his last name i was thought, you, i thought it was gayettes gayettes why would you think that you thought it was Gates? It's G A E T Z. You've never seen Gaietz? that before. Gaetz. You thought I don't it was know. Gates. I well, I I'd never heard of him before, if I'm honest. So I never had to just read the name, but mm -hmm. I would have guessed Gates. I, I suppose. Yeah. Gaetz. Gaetz. Yeah, that's all I have for that. I just thought that was a uh, that's a fun place to start. Yeah, that was a good that was a good intro. Get Matt Gates, Matt Gaetz, uh, Capital Attacker. Got another one. Yeah, another capital attacker is something that, uh, 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 something, uh, you know, much like Matt Guyatt's <laughs> would seem to be QAnon adjacent, um, but actually isn't. So for yeah. those of you uh, who don't know and get all your news from us, stop, first of all. So that, yeah, there was a new capital attacker. Uh, he drove a car into, what was it? Drove a car into a barrier, uh, un unfortunately did uh, kill one officer and then came out and attacked a few with a knife, got gunned down. Um, that was it. I, I don't know. I mean, there's, I don't think there's a ton. I, I, I don't think there's a ton interesting to say about this. Obviously it's a tragic story, um, but I think the thing that has been more interesting to me as is often the case with stuff like this has really been like more public and media reaction to it. I was wondering what you, what you were seeing from, from your vantage point for that. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I'll, I'll just be blunt about it. It's not who I thought it would be. And I mean in that about the demographic, I thought it was going to be like another um, kind of like incel white guy, crazy, and then, you know, I heard his name, which I think is Joshua Green. And I was like, oh, and, and he's from Indiana. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Another, like, white guy, lone wolf. Um, and he's not. He's actually um, someone, he actually follows someone that you and I are, I don't know, I don't want to call us fans of this guy, but, you know, yeah, we um, admire him in a way. Yeah, not fans. What would we say? Enthusiasts, that's even worse. No, we're not enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. uh, I take it back. Fascinated, in. fascinated by. Yeah, yeah, fascinated. Yeah, Louis Farrakhan. Yeah, and uh, Louis, Louis <laughs> Farrakhan. Yeah. How do you pronounce things when you don't have someone say it for anything? <laughs> so yeah, is this, is this always it? You find the most European way to say it. Uh, yeah. So I, you were the one who told me this that this guy was an ardent, or at least you know on Facebook uh, and social media was an ardent supporter of. Minister Louis Farrakhan mm -hmm. and the Nation of Islam, which, yeah, I gotta say, I did not see coming. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think that was the thing that, that that was really the only thing I wanted to say. Well, two things I wanted to say was, um, as I've mentioned on this show before, I, to my own mental detriment, uh, follow Soledad O'Brien mm -hmm. on Instagram just to see how the other half lives. Mm -hmm. And that was, I think it was her, one of her posts, you know, cause she, re, she, she like professionally posts on Instagram. I, I, she mm -hmm. must have like a team of interns doing it for her or something. Um, cause she's like near a tangent level meme po shit posting. Uh, but 
something she reposted was saying something to the effect of like, oh, and you still think having the military presence in the capital is a waste of money or the wrong yeah. thing to do. Fort and was trending. Yeah. Yeah. And my answer still is yes, we shouldn't have that. First of all, I mean, not for nothing, but had there not been barriers like that, maybe crazed people wouldn't be attacking them. Uh, second of all, like these things will happen. So like a increased military presence in our capital um, with no with no end date um, is never really a good thing. Um, the other thing that I got from this was that this, because what you found it from a New York Times article, but I have not heard anybody and even on like uh, news outlets like the Democracy Now! and stuff, like no one's really, really mentioned the Farrakhan angle. And I don't think they need to necessarily. Like, I don't think it's, um, I'm not, I'm not like, don't take this as me saying that like, oh, well, why aren't we calling out Nation of Islam? That's a big issue. No, I'm not saying that. No. Uh, but I'm saying that in the climate that we have to, today and in the climate where uh, left-wing media is so intent on talking about QAnon and especially talking about QAnon as it uh, pertains to the riots, um, I think it is important the omission of any other of any of these facts because in listeners' heads, in readers' heads, if you talk about a second attack on the on the Capitol, then people are going to think of that as synonymous with QAnon. They're going to assume, you know, reasonably assume that this is another Q person, and it isn't. Mm -hmm. And that's really all I had about that. Um, oh, I did have a fun. Uh, you want to hear a fun Farrakhan fact? <laughs> Always. Apparently, he's an incredibly accomplished concert violinist. Wow, I would have never have guessed that yeah that a million guesses would have never got that one uh, yeah i was listening to cornell west's uh podcast a little while ago and they were talking about music and uh I heard you were gonna say i was listening to him play well oh i was <laughs> yeah we, that should be our intro for this week joe oh yeah joe could we get some could we get <laughs> sonata paragon yeah could we get or even just like a Mozart sonata or some sort of intro yeah. like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I I was listening to Cornel West's uh, podcast and they were talking about um, like black music and like particularly hip hop and stuff and its influence on culture and stuff. And, and well, uh, Cornel West brought up that he used to be a concert violinist or like in his younger years and so he's a compl an accomplished vi violinist which i also didn't know and then in that conversation he, he said oh yeah i'm very good but you know who's even better farrakhan <laughs> seen him play how about uh, that that's that's great um so don't agree with the man's politics don't like the capital attacks that he uh you know inspired well and again let's not say he inspired it farrakhan wasn't telling people to attack capital hmm. but uh would love to hear him play <laughs> I, I wanted to make a distinction real quick so you think that they should like places like democracy now more progressive outlets they they should dive into this more to make a distinction between a q attack you think they're not diving into it more to just kind of conflate the two um, no, I don't, no, I don't think they should go into it. Like, I don't think it, you know, like, I don't think you should like turn it into like a hit piece on the nation of Islam or something like, yeah. I don't really think we need to be talking about Farrakhan at all. Like we started talking about that in, what was it? That was like something in the last few years where people were talking, like people were trying to bring up, um, anti-semitism in the black community and they were specifically oh. talking about louis farrakhan and it was like louis farrakhan has not been relevant for like 30 years like yeah. why are we we don't need to talk about him yeah. um uh, unless you're talking about his violent skills that uh, that we should be talking about all the time <laughs> yeah yeah uh I, he should be the the guest band on saturday night live uh but no, I don't think that, but I do think it's, uh, you know, it's sort of akin to a lie by omission in that I, I find it a little disingenuous when you, when you spend so much time fear mongering about QAnon and then you have something like this that fits the QAnon bill and, and it goes into your reporting 
dovetailing off of the January 6th attack and you don't take I mean, you don't take a moment to at least report and it's like this person was not a QAnon supporter. I see what you mean. I don't think it's in a, I, you know, and this is you know, maybe it's splitting hairs or something, but I do think there's just something a little. In my opinion, it's supportive of policy by omission in the sense that by not making that distinction, you are giving more credence to say like, because QAnon does this, we need stricter laws to do this. Yeah, it's just a, yeah, it's just not, yeah, it's not pinning the whole, it's not giving a full story. And it, and it like, whenever you're allowing people to fill in the blanks themselves, you know, it's like more attacks on the, on the Capitol, you know what that means? Like, yeah, I don't think we need to, again, I, I think, I think it would cause more problems uh, that, you know, and it would, and it would like cause more Q people probably to be like, see, it's the nation of Islam. It's not us or whatever. Yeah. Well, well, on that note, I think the more comp compelling story is this guy, his personal story just seems sad. He, he was, he was depressed. And I'm not saying that all depressed people would take a car and ram it into the Capitol. But I, I don't even think if you're depressed and listen to Louis Farrakhan, Louis Farrakhan, Louis <laughs> Farrakhan you were going, <laughs> but I can't stop it now. You're going you're to run a car into the Louis CK I, Farrakhan. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't. I, yeah, I don't think Far Farrakhan's really relevant. To, relevant. No, yeah, it's more. You know, more of the story, at least from what we saw from the Facebook post that they talked about on the New York Times, was you know stuff of stuff that we've seen a lot of over the last year of stuff of uh, a desperate young man who's lost his livelihood and probably lost purpose and stuff. And like, there's a real there's a real conversation that could be had there, mm -hmm. rather than. You know, not that we need to, not that we need to excuse this stuff, not that we need to hold this person up or give them more time in this, you know, time in the spotlight. Uh, but to, I, yeah, I, I just, I, I find it a little sad that we don't, um, that if we just let this be what the sold out O'Briens of the world would want of letting this turn, you know, continue this fight to make January 6th into gen z's 9 11 i guess uh or letting people assume because they're going to assume it's a q person yeah yeah i mean i that i thought that well I, I don't know if i thought it was a q person but it's you hear a capital attack and like you do have a knee-jerk reaction uh yeah i kind of just assumed i mean it sort of fits the bill yeah i agree i i think that's a good good point to transition on to hunter biden uh, the boy the, is back in town. <laughs> oh man! We before the before the show today, Ben and I watched um, two interviews with Hunter Biden, almost like almost about a sitcom's worth of Hunter Biden on CBS and I don't know what the other network was. CBS and something. Yeah, we watched a good a good sitcom level episode. I think next time we should just watch an episode of Frasier before we start. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think that'd be better. So what did you think? Okay, so just to catch everybody up, Hunter Biden is coming out with a uh, memoir called Beautiful Things uh, that is detailing sort of his, his life and more specifically his battle with addiction over the last five years. And I saw, I saw the... Uh, I saw an article about this coming out and my first thought, well, my first thought was like, Ooh, let this be like Hunter Biden's Motley Crue, the dirt. Mm -hmm. Like I want all the, I want all the nasty details, all the, the sex and rock and roll and crack. Um, and it doesn't sound like it's going to be that because like what I've, what, what everybody seems to be focusing on is a, the very real, like, first of all, I suppose I should just, make it clear we're not making fun of addiction we're not making fun of these very real world problems or death and all that stuff like yes like uh, i think a lot of that stuff probably is very compelling um but it's also uh, it's a little curious of i mean come on it's it's it, it's a hit piece against it, it's a continuation of one of our earlier episodes of people making a book out of the Trump years, it seems like. 
Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I obviously have not read the book. It just came out on Monday and I don't really plan to read it. Um, my guess... my copy is in the mail, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a review copy. Um, yeah, so he was on two interviews and the interview, one interview that we watched was uh, they, they covered uh, addiction, trauma, charisma, uh, all in one segment. I don't know if they covered the gun in that one or not, but um, probably, yeah. I mean, anyways, and then the other one was um, broken up into two segments. One was like the political scandal of Hunter Biden, and the other one was the the personal and the recovery. Um, and it interspersed through both uh, interviews are is just context, um, like kind of cutaways. And so Hunter is not actually not speaking; he's not narrating during that point. But it is like a journalist narrating the story. And I have some opinions about that, but I wanted to get your your reaction. Yeah, I guess I, maybe to clarify my earlier statement, there's there's sort of two sides of this to me, right? There's the there's the side of the book that's talking about one man's journey through loss and um, addiction and uh, pain and all of that, and I think you know I, for whatever it's worth, I I don't think any of that's bullshit. Like I've I've had friends with addiction, I've had I've had family members with addiction. Like that stuff is very serious, and I think I think that's just generally sincere. Just like in you know when the laptop leak stuff happened one of the things that came out which is probably the most likable joe biden's ever been was there was some conversations between joe biden and hunter where biden's like saying like you know i don't blame you i love you and stuff like that like i totally believe that stuff yeah I agree. right but the thing is you can't and maybe this is just a case of like maybe you shouldn't have written this book because you can't you can't talk about that stuff without talking about a lot of really fucking shady issues surrounding Hunter Biden that are like absolutely like Overton window non grata conversation um, in public discourse on left wing media, which mm -hmm. would be the laptop scandal. Uh, shout out Glenn, Glenn Greenwald. Uh, the Burisma, which was the uh, board position he took for a Ukrainian oil. For, uh, liquefied natural gas. Liquefied natural gas. When, when it should be mentioned, uh, the US and EU were supporting the Maidan coup against the current government aligned with Russia who had gas contracts. Yeah, well, well Joe Biden was uh, vice president. And actively uh, negotiating foreign policy in the Ukraine. Yeah, so so there's that, and then there's the stuff of the gun, which we can get into in a little bit, which, like, the gun's more of... Uh, the gun's sort of in between. I don't think the gun is that important. Um, there's... It's just weird. It's curious. It's uh, We'll get into it in a moment, but, you know, there's a little bit of shadiness about it, but the gun is like, I don't know, the guy was a crack addict, and he had a gun. It's yeah. Pretty, pretty common rich crackhead in Delaware sort of shit. I, you know, I don't think it's had a big deal, but like the Burisma stuff and the laptop stuff is like, it's like there's real substantial stuff there. So, sorry, I'm meandering a little bit. So yeah, so there's the very, yeah, there's the real, there's the real family issues, the real personal issues, drug issues. And then there's like all this other stuff that you can't, you're not allowed to have this book and write about unless you're going to address that. And of course they're not going to address it in any real way because that would actually open up, open up the door to scrutiny. So instead of doing that, it's just like completely like sticking to the, you know, campaign talking points and also having is like i haven't read it yet but from as much as like from what we've seen a lot of time spent on how i don't know kind of insinuating that it was trump's fault or trump made it so much worse yeah that that he made it a, a talking point and they they conflated in my opinion they conflated his his addiction and recovery to that yeah you know they can blade addiction and recovery to these choices about like working on the ukrainian <laughs> Like with financial ga gas company. Yeah, yeah, those are those are two different things. And let's be clear, like the Burisma thing is just I, anybody anybody with a brain can look at that and go, yeah, that's a shady deal. Yeah. 
it's clear nepotism. It's a clear conflict of interest. Um, like it just stunk on its face. And like the fact that they're like still sticking to the guns of like, no, or like, yeah, people are asking him if he, one of the interviews was asking him, would you do it again? And he was like, no, I wouldn't have done it again or I wouldn't do it again because I didn't realize how the previous administration would weaponize it against yeah. us, which is like, horse shit any administration would have done that yeah i mean it should it should have been a scandal at the time yeah well it's a it is a scandal like it would be a scandal with anybody it would be a scandal if it was if it was don jr eric trump doing that like it's a it's a scandal yeah yeah and so to act like to act like it was just like oh well it was just you know this the indecency of trump and like how they just like didn't play but you know they didn't have proper decorum about this issue is like fucking stupid yeah it's weird that he didn't admit admit it was a mistake i think he he had regrets but it wasn't a mistake no well they he doesn't think it was it was the wrong thing to do and you know i'm sure neither does joe biden or neither Mm. neither does most most people in washington because that is i mean it's common let's you know like i guess i guess that's worth it's worth saying that I'm aware that this is common practice among uh, DC elite and their children or their spouses. It happens all the time. That doesn't mean it's good. Yeah. And doesn't mean it's not corrupt and nepotism and way people are making a shit ton of money for no fucking reason. Cause they're just banking on their family's name and getting meetings and, you know, greasing, greasing wheels for, uh, for daddy. Uh, so yeah, it's the, yeah, the, I don't want to, I don't want to stick on Brisbane too much, but it's like, it's a clear conflict of interest and it's clearly corrupt. Yeah. And I think the thing that I wanted to bring up earlier about adding in these like family photos, the car crash, um, which killed Biden's then wife, uh, Hunter's mom, as well as uh, Hunter's sister, um, Joe Biden. And they even showed that Joe Biden was, um, sworn in, in the hospital where presumably she died i just i think it takes away from that like david frost moment that is supposed to happen with these journalists who are conducting the interview you know they're you know one of them was like you could you should have clearly known this was not going to work this is this looked bad blah 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 and i just think that if you you have all this context like this like this compelling story about hunter about recovering from addiction all these things your your weight that you have behind questions like that is really diminished I don't understand the point of the book Mm -hmm. uh, other than, well, obviously, you know, it's a cash grab anytime any of these people writes a book. And by the way, Hunter didn't write the fucking book. None of these people write their own books. Yeah. Obama, Obama might just because he's so well, because he actually is super smart and probably just loves, you know, putting his words to pen or whatever the fuck you know but for, the, for, for, this, for that question <laughs> <laughs> shout out casey we should have casey should we do like a should we do a book club with uh yeah let's, if i can get a free copy i will read the book yeah yeah we should yeah and <laughs> we'll make sure that casey has a copy and bring him on for a yeah we need to get to the point of frame where or the point of fame where we start getting free books yeah Oh, so by the way, by, by the way, Hunter was on the the World Food Program board. Yeah. Come on, what was I saying? Sorry, Joe. Joe will make sense of this in post, won't you, Joe? Uh, <laughs> Joe. <laughs> Joe's got it. Yeah. Not Joe Biden, by the way. Our producer, <laughs> Joe. Yeah. So now he didn't write the fucking book, but no one does. That's not a comment on his, you know, mental acuity or his ability to write. Uh, Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's a cash grab, but it, it's, it totally seems like it, it seems like it's just, yeah, more banking on malice towards Trump, which I guess fine. But the thing with the laptop now is that he doesn't remember. And I know a lot, some of you may think you know where I'm going with this. You don't, because I know a lot of like right wing commentators or whatever. Tucker Carlson will definitely be talking about this, being like, he doesn't, he doesn't remember. remember. Very, Very curious. curious. That's my Tucker impression. Um, on him not remembering the laptop, I believe it. That if you're on a five-year crack binge, you're gonna 
you know, you're gonna you're gonna lose some stuff in the interim. You missed uh, it. So fair, but the insinuation that comes right after that is like it's a it's always like with a wink and the nod of like I don't remember. I could have had a laptop, could have not, not sure, like was doing a lot of crack, whatever. Could have been Russia, wink wink, could have could have been hacked probably russia like that's like the main selling point of this is the and the thing that really annoys me is that you know there's like a chapter in this book that's just going on russiagate shit still and like still talking about like the kremlin trying to write disinformation you just just again trying to like i think we talked about this in one of the last episodes but like they just won't let it go of like no no the russia tried to win the election for trump and even if they did it didn't work why are we still talking about it yeah i i don't want to get into it right now but i do i, I just see this as a big biden pr ad it makes him yeah. look really good and I, I i believe that he's a good dad i mean he looks like he'd be a good dad i bet yeah i believe he's a good dad i feel like i think i've said this before but i feel like i'd love him if he was like my neighbor yeah you know I, yeah, I agree. Totally. We could do we could do calisthenics together in the morning. I mean, you'd probably mow his grass. He'd mow his grass. He'd mow, he'd mow my grass. He'd be in better shape than me. He he'd spot me while I'm benching. I actually think it'd be great to work out with Joe Biden. We, we, we could, yeah, we trainer. could, we could, yeah, we could fat shame people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> push up contest. <laughs> push up contest. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I was pretty upset about the these interviews. I, I, I think it kind of can bring us on to nobody asked for this because really nobody did ask for this. Aside from people who want to rewrite history. about Yeah, I think we didn't ask for this, but a lot of people asked for it. I'm sure it's uplifting and stuff, but uh, I think you're right. I think you said what I was trying to say much quicker is that it is PR. Um, and it's trying to, and yeah, I think it's, I think it's trying to tie up some loose ends uh, poorly with yeah. the laptop specifically in Burisma and then um oh I just I did want to get on the gun thing just real quick uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh let me pull this up uh so one of the things in um the illustrious uh you know the life and times of Hunter Biden is that he well, he did, you know, fun fact, and again, not to not to victim shame or anything, but he did have an affair with uh, his uh, brother's late wife after Bo passed away. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm not judging that. I could see how that would happen uh, or whatever. I, I did Wait, cut it about that. Sorry. Just what? Say. I did forget about that. Yeah, it was a thing. I don't think, I th again, I don't, I don't want to like yeah, victim yeah, blame or whatever, because like that's some, you know, grief does extraordinary things to people. And like, again, that's going to be something that like Tucker Carlson's like, where are you going to believe a man who <laughs> sleeps with his brother's wife? You know, so shut up. But uh, Hunter Biden did have in, you know, in true crackhead form, had a gun for whatever reason. You, you know, if you're doing crack deals, you should probably have a gun. Uh, Bo's ex-wife found it, uh, kind of Sons of Anarchy style, threw it into a trash can, probably next to a middle school. Uh, <laughs> and the gun, the gun was retrieved, you know, no harm, no foul kind of, but there's like a little bit of, there was a little bit of smoke around that of the, uh, of reports that the secret service was involved with the retrieval of this gun. And when asked about this in the interview, uh, Hunter Biden like emphatically is like, no, I, the secret, I wouldn't know, but the secret, secret service wasn't involved. Like that's nonsense or whatever. They don't follow up on it at all. So I just wanted to bring up this uh, article from Politico, which was published on the 25th of March uh, by Tara Paul Mary and Ben Schreckinger. That's how I pronounce it, Dan. Uh, titled Sources Secret Service Inserted Itself into Case of Hunter Biden's Gun. The bizarre incident involved a trash can, a man searching for recyclables, and eventually federal law enforcement. Ah, so it was a guy. 
getting like soda cans and something and then he found it anyway uh so yeah they're saying that like secret service wasn't i'm, I'm just going to read from here but uh so they're saying that biden says that the secret service wasn't involved right they're saying that's kind of right-wing conspiracy bullshit but this said but a curious thing happened at the time. Secret Service agents approached the owner of the store where Hunter bought the gun and asked to take the paperwork involving the sale, according to two people, one of whom has firsthand knowledge of the episode and the other was briefed by a Secret Service agent after the fact. The gun store owner refused to supply the paperwork, suspecting that the Secret Service officers wanted to hide Hunter's ownership of the missing gun in case it were to be involved in a crime, the two people said. The owner, Ron Palmieri, later turned over the papers to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, which oversees federal gun laws. The Secret Service says it has no record of its agents investigating the incident, and Joe Biden, who was not under protection at the time, said through a spokesperson he has no knowledge of any Secret Service involvement. So, again, this is one of those things where my conspiratorial mind is going to say, of course they were involved. Why wouldn't they? They would definitely try and shred the files on this. Yeah. Again, I don't think it's the most important thing of the story. Uh, I think it's something that other people will latch on to and make a bigger deal of. But like, come on, where there's smoke, there's fire. And where there's smoke, the Secret Service will try and cover it up. Like, that's... Yeah. That's a no-brainer. And I don't even think it reflects poorly on Hunter Biden or necessarily Joe Biden or mm -hmm. the administration. But it's just like, that's what, again, shout out Casey Gain. Like, that's what, that's what these organizations fucking do. Like, they shred all evidence of it. Of course, they would try and cover that shit up. You know what sucks is that the left really refuses to cover stories like these. And it, it allows people like Tucker Carlson to cover stories like these with those terrible angles that you were talking about before, you know, that really do add that personal dynamic that is cruel and meant to incite like this, this visceral reaction. Yeah, I think, I mean, yeah, that's the big problem that I'm thinking about with this is that like, I don't think Hunter Biden's a bad person. And I don't think having an addiction problem makes you a bad person or actually is a character flaw it is it is a result of 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 trauma it is a serious issue and like people should not be maligned or demonized uh for having these problems and this it's good for these stories to be told um because you know i i you know i'm sure that his story will help a lot of people or could help a lot of people who are going through these problems and the thing is when you but the, there's there's the politics and the corruption angles of this too, which are you know separate, um, but connected. And when you when you refuse to talk about those substantial issues, then it opens up doors for assholes on the right, like uh, Tucker Carlson or Newsmax or whoever the fuck, to make this into an indictment on this piece of shit crackhead. And like that sucks. I think that's a, a good way to end. I guess we need to talk about AOC. Yeah, can we can we watch this clip? This is her talking about yeah, when people are like why aren't you talking about kids with cages and she got all indignant. Now the first thing I want to say is that the fact that this keeps happening over and over and over again is a political failure by both parties. And I want to be very clear about that because I don't want to draw false equivalents. What is happening here is not the same as what happened during the Trump administration, where they took babies out of the arms of their mothers and deported their families and permanently traumatized these children, some of whom we don't know will ever be reunified with their family again, which is a level of human rights violation that is just simply not the same. Both of these things are barbaric and they're wrong. But when you rip a baby out of the hands of a mother, you cannot draw the same comparison. And anyone who is trying to do that is doing a profound disservice 
to the cause of justice. So I don't want to excuse any of this, but I'm also, I don't think we should also get them twisted together because one is not the same. And we cannot dust that under the rug. And by the way, those families are owed reparations, period. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to excuse this, but I will. And here's how. Yeah, exactly. That was my, my initial reaction as well. It's like, hey, I'm not going to justify this, but here's a video of me justifying this. Yeah, it's. Don't get me wrong. It's different, but it's, it's the same policy. Yeah, it's different. And we talked about this in the last one of his press conference where he was saying that, you know, what's changed, nothing's changed and nothing has changed. So it's just that we don't call it cages anymore. They're now detention facilities. And for me, the biggest thing that's upsetting is that they prevented reporters from, from going there at all. Do you remember that? And yeah. when, when asked, they're like, will, will you allow reporters to go there? They said soon. Yeah, why not? Why not right now? It's infuriating. Right now. Yeah, we gotta we gotta clean up a little bit. What does that even mean? Like, imagine if Trump said that. Yeah, exactly. And I wanted to talk about something that I had sent Dan a little bit ago. A friend of mine sent me this, and uh, it was because AOC is very active on her uh, Insta story, whatever, where she got asked. Uh, you know, she has like that "ask me anything" thing, and. Uh, someone asked why aren't you talking about kids in cages anymore and like she like gets like all like just like absolutely indignant and like real like like kind of like sassy pose thing like really like leaning into the camera and stuff you can't i'm leaning into my camera right now as if anybody can see me but but uh but yeah getting like what do your aoc voice oh no i'm not going to do that (laughs) no that's a bad idea it won't be good anyway uh but yeah, she got like gets like super indignant. Like, are you kidding me? Like, let me. I almost. I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. Patreon. But, yeah. Actually, no. We so, will never do that. Yeah, yeah we're not doing that. Mm-hmm. Tucker Carlson all day, but not not AOC, and not because I think she deserves it necessarily. But yeah, but she gets really indignant and really in your face about just like, well, let me give you the facts. Let me tell you what's real and like what you're mis- what you're not understanding. And and that she goes into a diatribe of like we he was like, well, if you want to talk like if you want to talk about this, then you really need to talk about basically government and you know, US interventions into these countries that have that have uh caused these people to need to, you know, leave their homes and like uh global warming caused mostly by us and by you know shitty policies and all these things of a history of like the dark long dark history of america in uh in south america and central america that has led to this all of which is factually true by the way i agree with that but the thing is like it was like yeah you can go and say you know say this nice this nice sassy speech and shit but like I don't know. Last time I checked, you're still backing Juan Guaido as the president of Venezuela. Like, I'm sorry. What the fuck are you doing to address any of these problems then? If they're so if they're as big as you say, then what fucking legislation are you putting forward? And I know that people get mad when uh, like people like Jimmy Dore or whatever really go after AOC because they're not doing enough. And always the always 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 the thing now is like well their hands are tied there's not that many of them it's just three of them first of all it's not just three of them it's like eight people in the squad now which actually like it or not is enough to sway uh to sway votes even though they're not nancy pelosi and all that shit like these people do have power especially like 15 dollars minimum wage could have been done i don't care what anybody says it could have been done if it's a must pass bill then you and they must pass it then you can say well we're not going to vote for it unless you have this legislation in there and like i get the argument sometimes of like well we could put this forward but it'll just get knocked down or whatever but it's just like well then what the fuck are you good for like i don't need you that like even if you're going to try and fail then like why should i still like you why should i still support you when you're not at least putting up the effort and at least put like and this is the thing that really drives me crazy about AOC now and about like a lot of a lot of the squad but particularly her because she's got the most visibility 
um, is, and particularly from that Insta story, which was like also had like the uh, like her words popping up, like you know, as like subtitles, but it was like real like you know, something you'd see on, yeah, like an influencer's thing. And it's just like, I feel like she's more influencer than legislator at this point. Mm -hmm. And it goes back into the thing we just watched of, of like, yes, you have all these very clickable speeches and sometimes they're substantive, but like your, your actions aren't doing anything anymore. Like what happened, what happened to the young woman who was like, posting up outside of Nancy Pelosi's office and like and protesting in that like where where is that AOC because I want her back yeah I want the internal friction that's why we that I didn't vote for her because I'm not in that district but like that's why that's why she got where she is like that's why people want her and like I just don't know how I mean I guess she'll she'll be in you know she'll be in Congress for as long as she wants and probably be president at some point uh, I mean who, who's going to challenge her you, like I don't think you're going to have some establish, establishment dim come in there and manage anything. Yeah, I, yeah, no. but it's like we're we're watching her. You know, either you die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become Nancy Pelosi. Uh, <laughs> and I feel like that's what we're watching. Like that, like that fucking speech we just watched of like both are inexcusable, but the one that's happened already and is out of office and has no power over this shit anymore is the one you should be mad about it's like now like that like politics are are here and right now they're immediate yeah i i know we were going to debate her status as an influencer and the effects and i think we can still talk about that but i do want to mention in agreement with you the we just had an election based on such urgency you know it wasn't just COVID 19 it was the the economy's failing it's climate change it's it's myriad things and it we've lost that and it, it seems that people are now upset that a section of us are still are still agitated enough to want to keep fighting for these things yeah exactly and and then all of a sudden it's like gauche to bring it up or to try and be to the left of these people yeah which and, is but, really the people who like of you know the jimmy doors or like joe rogan's or fucking uh What's her name from Hawaii? Um, Pelosi. Yeah, take that back. Uh, yeah, but it's like, you know, the Jimmy Doors or the Tulsi Gabbards, the Joe Rogans or whoever, like, when they espouse stuff that is actually to the left of AOC and the squad, all of a sudden they're like outsider assholes who are, you know, extreme right wing or whatever the fuck, just because they're bringing up stuff that you fucking promised us. Yeah, I think a good point about the immigration debate is that and you bring this up in the, the last episode, and it really made me think about it differently, is that we really do focus on this border, this physical place where people are coming north to reach the United States from Latin America, right? But we, we really do not talk about, like, what is Biden's anti-corruption plan to fix these so-called problems? These, these people do not want to, do not want to flee I'm sure they'd rather stay home in their own country where they feel comfortable. They speak the language. They know the laws. They, I'm, they're they fearful of their governments, obviously, or natural disaster or anything that's happening there currently. But I don't think they want to make that trek. And I would love yeah. to hear what Joe Biden's plan is. I'd love to hear AOC articulate that. Yeah. How are you going to challenge it? And like the dirty war stuff just really got my back up when she was saying that because it was like, yes, I 100% agree with you. Yeah. What are what when have I like this is the first I've ever heard from you really talking about it. Why aren't you put like why why isn't this a, a you know a touchstone of your of your legislation? What bills are you putting forward for this? Because that is what you like again, this thing is like this thing of talking about how like oh well we just don't have any power. It's like you are in like the 0.001% of powerful people in the United States, not monetarily, but you actually vote on shit. You can actually, I can't put a bill up. Yeah, and I think that does come back to, again, this debate that we were supposed to have about social strategy and her becoming more of an influencer than a politician. And I think that, you know, after watching this video, I kind of had a seed change myself. Like I thought that it was helpful. I mean, obviously it is helpful for, for her to, to be on social media and use it in such a, a powerful and impactful way 
but I, I'm just not seeing it for the right reasons right now. I'm seeing it, well, to be more specific, specific, I'm seeing it for establishment Democrat positions, which is upsetting. Ye- yeah, it's good. I'm I'm fine with using your, you know, she has a huge platform and I'm absolutely fine with using it, you know, aggressively and frequently. Uh, but if that's if that's all you're doing, then who gives a shit? Yeah. It's like you can like you're already an influencer. You can like why don't you just like retire and just do that for your fucking job? If it's not going to change anything effectively of how we're, you know, how we're governed, then and you clearly like doing this shit more, you can keep doing it. Yeah. You probably she, don't even she, need the Instagram. No. If you're going to advocate for those positions. I, I think that's all I got on AOC. Yeah, yeah I think that's all I got. Well, to be continued, but... A- AOC watch. Um, you're I, on notice. Yeah. Um, I was thinking... I was gravitating towards this, so I think we should just do it. Um For me, this is a nobody asked for this, but uh, it's a Britney Spears update as well. Yeah. And the headline is Britney Spears finally comments on New York Times hashtag free Britney doc. In in the quote, the leading quote is embarrassed by the light they put me in. So her full statement is this. And um, for any of you who haven't seen Britney Spears videos, uh, this might be hard to convey with my voice, but and I'm not going to do Britney Spears. But um, she, she does type very social media savvy. So I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to um, bring that in. So it says, this, this is, she made a post about this, by the way. And this is the caption. It says, my life has always been very speculated, dot, dot, dot. Watched, dot, dot, dot. And judge really my whole life, three exclamation points. For my sanity, I need to dance to uh, at I am Stephen T. Stephen Tyler, by the way, um, of uh, Aerosmith. Right. And, and specifically the song Crazy, uh, which is the video that she was uh, yeah, yeah. dancing to with, you know, with this post. Um, so dance to I am Stephen T every night of my life. And then three dance emojis to feel wild and human and alive. Three exclamation points. I've been exposed my whole life performing in front of people with the, the emotion that's like, uh, and that's me like with my eyebrows up and surprised. And yeah, then the, wi- the wide eyed emoji. Yes. Thank you. It takes a lot of strength to trust, in all caps, the universe with your real vulnerability because I've always been so judged, dot, 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 insulted, dot, 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 and embarrassed by the media, dot, dot, dot. And I am still to this day, and then the thumbs down emoji, four exclamation points. As the world keeps on turning and life goes on, we still remain so fragile and sensitive as people, dot, dot, dot. I didn't watch the documentary, but from what I did see of it, I was embarrassed by the light they put me in. Dot, dot, dot. I cried for two weeks and well, dot, dot, dot. I still cry sometimes, exclam- four exclamation points. I do what I can in my own spir- spirituality with myself to try and keep my own joy, dot, 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 love, dot, 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 and happiness. Um, stars, prayer hands emoji, uh, sun emoji, four exclamation points. Everyday dancing brings me joy. Uh, three exclamation points. I'm not I'm not here to be perfect, dot, 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 perfect is boring, dot, dot, dot. I'm here to pass on kindness. Three kisses, four exclamation points. All right, so what's your take? Well, I mean, isn't nobody asked for this because there's no way she, like, what, what, did, what did people expect that she was going to, like, have this articulate response? And I, I don't think that she's, if, if she's seriously in the space that we think she is, where she's, like, kind of controlled by her father's, like, um, you know master of puppet hands or whatever like i just don't think this she could have had a real response if she even wanted one uh so basically the the idea is that like people are saying she had like a kind of characteristically wacky childish response to it Uh, i see it that way but maybe maybe i'm just being cruel here yeah i don't know well, I don't know. I, I thought like maybe I think people were expecting to come to Damascus moment and like she was going to like say like, yes, everything in here is absolutely true. You know, my father does control me. I want to get out of this, etc. Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Well, I mean, yeah, that was like what the doc portrayed it was kind of a broken person, um, which anybody who's seen her social media presence, I think it's been that for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. It's mostly sad. I don't know if I have anything yeah. to say on it. Yeah, no, I, it was just kind of surprised by the comment. And um, yeah, I, I don't think that she, I still think that she doesn't need her father in the conservatorship or whatever. Nah, that shit's it's, fucked it's up. Really, yeah, it's really shady. I mean, yeah. 
Yeah, free Britney, right? Yeah, free, um, hashtag free Britney, hashtag Pizza Gates. I thought we could go on to uh, you hurting our feelings with uh, Southern fancy man Lindsey Graham. Yeah, this I, I saw this earlier in the week, and it was just kind of stupid. Um, it's kind of a, it's kind of well. I mean, as is, I'll let you explain it. But yeah, as is like. Uh, as is the point with the you're hurting our feelings is it's like it's totally a non-story like it's one of those things where as is characteristic of our you're hurting our feelings thing is it's like not a story and not newsworthy but it was uh lindsey graham talking about i saw don lemon commenting on it i guess lindsey graham talking about why he needs an ar-15 yeah 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 do you want <laughs> sure, to explain yeah. and then i will do a lindsey graham impression maybe oh, oh okay good um yeah so this is actually offensive um, when you view it in context, but just stupid without. Um, Lindsey Graham goes to a gun range with an AR-15 and shoots. And he explains that the reason he owns an AR-15 is to protect himself from gangs during a natural disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Which like, I don't know, it's, it's telling, it's always funny to me when uh, like these right wing people like talk about like when, when the world inevitably, it's like, it's like something they're admitting that they don't mean to is like, like when the world inevitably goes to shit and we're in like a Mad Max type hellscape which probably will happen if the world keeps going the way it is that they're going to need their guns. And it's like, I guess that's true. Uh, you're not supposed to give up the game like that, but he's just like, just let, you know, when they come to my house with the pitchforks and knives and coming to rape my children and whatever, wait, he doesn't have children, but anyway, yeah. that Like basically that like uh, Lindsey Graham's going to be going to be standing on his rooftop. Like it's the LA riots with his, AR-15 just like mowing down roaming gangs yeah it's like it's, it's like good. it's yeah I don't know I don't know what just to say about it other than it's like yeah giving up the game Lindsay like we well, all know the world's going that way what, what hurts my feelings about it is one it was right after this the AR the the Boulder Colorado shooting so it is it is propaganda for the AR-15 and propaganda for second for second amendment rights. Oh, yeah, it's sort of going back to our gun lobby discussion. It's totally that it's right out of that playbook, right? It's yeah. right off. It's right out of NRA TV. <laughs> and I think I think the issue is which uh, by the way, NRA TV, you could not have a worse spokesman for like selling like the tough guy like operator gun enthusiasts like uh mascot than lindsey fucking graham yeah and you know who was um head i don't know if he was head of the nra or if he was head of nra tv you remember who that is no oliver north oh yeah yeah he was the head of the nra <laughs> yeah and then i think wayne lapierre ran nra TV. yeah i don't know it was like a med medjuved putin situation <laughs> yeah yeah um shout out ali north yeah Friend yeah Any, anyways what a, what the you're hurting your feelings aspect is i think it's a right wing thing is they just want to see Lindsey graham shooting ar-15 to protect their second amendment rights and it's a stupid news story i mean i want to see Lindsey graham shoot an ar-15 because i imagine like the kickback from the gun will knock him like <laughs> back 20 feet in like a looney tune style like <laughs> through <laughs> through the shed of an outhouse <laughs> yeah i'd love to watch lindsey that. graham is in hospital with a shattered collarbone <laughs> because he's never done a physical activity in his life besides fucking square dancing i'm gonna volley this lindsey graham actually fun fact also dances to uh steven tyler <laughs> alone in his bedroom so britney spears said crazy which aerosmith song do you think lindsey graham would dance to Ooh, I don't really know in Aerosmith because, uh, fun fact, Aerosmith sucks. I know a few Aerosmith songs. I'm thinking. Oh, you know what? It, know what it would be? The uh, theme song from Armageddon. Don't want to miss a thing. Yeah, that's Lindsey Graham plays that on repeat and yeah. sings in his mirror. I like a few Aerosmith songs. Jaded. Remember Jaded? Yeah, I I don't get down on Aerosmith. I don't understand why they're a rock staple. <laughs>
I have theories about this, not not for now, um, as why as to why they're not a rock staple. But I'm trying to think of what their their logo is for for Andrew, and we can make sure to put it on. Yeah, yeah, and um, maybe have "Don't Wanna Close My Eyes" as the transition from this into the next uh, segment. I'm gonna volley up this next segment for you, just so you can spike it. Um, Trump spoke at a wedding, and I thought a good category for this. Would be, uh... Yeah, news that makes you say no shit. Uh, so as I think we all saw Trump, I don't. I guess we don't really know the full story of how it happened, but if, from what it seems, Trump just like showed up at the wedding reception at Mar-a-Lago <laughs> and spoke, like just just grabbed, grabbed the microphone and started talking, I guess ostensibly to give a toast to the bride and groom, right? Um, Cause they're members yeah. there and that place costs like half a million dollars a year to, be a yeah for a membership um but yeah so tmz i saw the footage through tmz of him giving a speech which is just him like pulling out the oldies talking about what a, you know it was kind of it was kind of like pulling out his his greatest hits from cpac yeah about about what a disaster uh the biden administration has been and doing uh his his new catchphrase uh which is do you miss me at but just, yeah, just talk about, oh, it's such a disaster. They should have, you know, whatever. He was talking about like, oh, the border, if they would have just done, like we left him with the most secure border. We did all this shit and like, um, oh, it's so fucking funny. Just cause, I mean, first of all, I think, cause some of the reactions from people were like, were like, oh my God, he just went to these people's wedding and just talked about Biden the whole time. And it was like, dude, that was, first of all, they're Mar-a-Lago people. That was the greatest moment of their life hands down yeah. you know everybody in that room was loving every fucking minute minute of it yeah uh, I, know, I know i made the stupid joke but i just imagine the bride having more wedding wedding photos with trump than the groom i mean if it, trump had it his way yeah definitely yeah uh, yeah i i thought it was funny i mean i think it's a good fit for him i think like i you know i think this I think it's a good fit for him. Like, I think moving forward and trying to uh, navigate where where his place in the world is, mm -hmm. being a like a you know wedding MC or like guest appearance at Marlaga weddings is a good way to fill out the schedule. Yeah, and also that could be part of like the catering bill. You know, it'd be like okay, so canapes costs i mean let's be honest it's mar-a-lago it's like canapes cost thirty thousand dollars <laughs> and for an extra ten thousand dollars you can get a personalized speech from uh donald trump talking about you know how much elizabeth warren sucks or whatever you know <laughs> you think it's a la carte or you think it's all inclusive like tiered, Ooh, tiered options i mean if they're smart it should yeah if they're smart it should be a la carte i think yeah. there should be i think there i think there can be the blanket speech that we saw that was like the taster right mm -hmm. that was you know that was the uh that was the baseline what you get but if you want to have your favorites so you know an extra 5k for little mike bloomberg um talking shit about hunter biden is double yeah yeah i thought it was great though uh it was it just it may it makes so much sense of him just sort of I mean, he, that's, that's who he, that's who he is, is like the, you know, what it makes me think of is like, I remember a, a bar I went to when I was traveling once in, uh, in, in uh, Portugal. And uh, there was this like Irish bar that all of the TripAdvisor stuff, all the reports from the TripAdvisor would be like, oh yeah, it's a great bar, great drink menu. But like, this weird old Irishman showed up and like would not stop talking to us and like smoking in our faces and talking about how he had connections to the Corsican mob and stuff. Turns out this like that's a real thing. I didn't meet him while I was there, uh, but uh, but he but yeah, that was like the owner of the bar would just like harass customers <laughs> and like hijack their table and like and and was really bothersome. But like I think that's just what I think that's a perfect fit for Trump is just kind of just kind of yeah like sauntering around mar-a-lago and like you know show you know showing up on the golf course and like taking someone's club out of their hand and swinging for them or like giving some some stupid story about how we fucked christy turlington or some shit you know like 
<laughs> really like Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah, yeah exactly. Just a, yeah. just like a love, like a, a lovable menace. It it reminds me of something that you said um, right after the C CPAC episode. Is you don't think he's going to run, and this makes me feel even more so. I, th I think this is him in his element. I think politics obviously is too complicated for him and he doesn't want to do it. Well, yeah, again, and like he he sees the world in like catchphrases and tweets. Like that's yeah. how he talks. That's how he thinks. And like, I, again, like, do you miss me yet is like the greatest slogan he's ever had. It's not yeah. bad P from a PR standpoint. It's a good slogan, you know, do you miss me yet? Woo! Yeah. Uh, and I think he's enjoying it. Yeah, he's he's living the high life. Yeah. It's way better slogan than make America great. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, actually that that reminds me of something that always irritated me during the Trump years is everybody would do the make something great again or make America do this again. Yeah, make Never... America work again, make America mm -hmm. Yeah, and and they even even like if you were a Hillary supporter, you took on the nasty woman. Uh, oh yeah what was it like nasty women get shit done or some bullshit yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and again don't try and play his playbook he's the only one that's what i mean it's just lame and i really yeah. think it just fed into to the reaction of like trump supporters and you know led to divisiveness and everything yeah. and for now um i don't even remember what hillary's slogan was building together maybe hillary's slogan was uh i know joe's is build back better yeah, that was that's a terrible one. Um, Hillary's was I'm with her. Right. Which could have been I'm better. With... I mean, like, I, I I think on the surface, it's better than it's it's obviously wasn't as res it didn't resonate as much as Make America Great Again, but I don't think it's a bad one. Yeah. I think I think it's better than Nasty Woman just because that was a stupid thing that Trump said. Yeah, I mean, it's better than whatever her, you know, if Hillary wrote her own one, it would be, I'm Hillary Clinton, vote for me, you plebeian fox. <laughs> I'm Hillary Clinton, and I don't like people. Uh, yeah. Oh, Hillary. So, yeah, that's that's news that makes you say no shit. Of course Trump did that. Yeah. We got some gut reactions, right? Oh, do we? I can't wait. <laughs> I'm going to start with the, the silly one. And, yeah, again, gut reactions are... I'm just I'm I'm sending Ben links right now and he's going to open and give me his gut reaction. All right, so this is from the AP. Oh god, yeah, I saw this. Rut row, Biden pooch drops doggy do in White House hallway. I'm so sick of hearing about these fucking dogs. It was unclear which pooch, major or champ, dropped the poo. So, yeah, someone Someone shit in the White House. A tale as old as time. Uh, By the way, this yeah. article ends with President Donald Trump did not have a pet in the White House. Just uh... right, like uh, let's yeah, just make sure that we uh, give both sides of the fucking story. <laughs> God damn it! Who is it? Like, I think uh, Katie Halper was talking about this on, on uh, Rising. Uh, but she, yeah, this is kind of the point that I think of is like, they need to fucking stop trying to do these stupid dog puns. Yeah. Like all this like rut row oh, or yeah. pawtastic or all this shit. Like it's total, like, it's like, it's like, did every fucking news source become the New York post <laughs> of trying, like trying to play that game. It's so fucking stupid. And like, sorry, I love dogs. I do not want to hear white house dog stories i mean i might follow them on instagram or something like i love a cute dog or whatever but we yeah. get it they're poorly trained dogs and <laughs> this gives me a chance to to talk about um one of them being sent to to delaware back to delaware and yeah i sent to a farm yeah. that dog is dead by the way everybody yeah. that, that, <laughs> he's <laughs> gone to a farm upstate <laughs> they euthanized that dog <laughs> they didn't um supposedly from what we know which yeah, well. the, uh, speaking of katie halper um the big structural bailey jokes that they used to make oh god yeah for for Even anybody how. who doesn't remember that was part of uh elizabeth warren's hapless campaign they had it, it was like a giant model of her dog or something right yeah 
Yeah, it was the big structural Bailey, which I guess I don't know if that had something to do with some sort of political something or other of like structural change or whatever. But bailout, and but she made it Bailey. Too clever. You, yeah, you're trying to be too clever, and you're not cool or likable, Elizabeth Warren. I mean, I you know no no reason to dance on her dead campaign, but uh, yeah, big structural Bailey was another one where it was like, oof, stop. It was, it was very try hard. Well, um, we have, speaking of New York Post, check the chat. I love a good New York Post. And, and you have to watch the video. Jill Biden speaking to California farmers. Yeah, Jill Biden butchers Spanish pronunciation during speech to California farmers. So say it with me. She said Broadway. The future. <laughs> <laughs> see say she say quadre quadre she she pronounces shit like you pronounce names <laughs> oh man quadre oh. she sounds like she has a speech impediment yeah oh. not to disparage the differently able but oh my god wow yeah that's that's just like so yeah and that's i mean that's a common theme too of like old white politicians trying to trying to pander to uh spanish spanish language and it's like i feel like i feel like most like native spanish speakers would just be like hey you don't have to you don't have to try and like we know you can't speak it you don't you don't need to do that it was like do you remember when hillary clinton uh was running and she was like she was like in an interview she was like you know i'm just like your abuela Oh, and uh, yeah. yeah which uh abuela means uh grandmother and then the hashtag started trending known me abuela <laughs> hillary clinton is not my grandmother was it I called wish, the I, disinfo campaign I, yeah i wish there was more pluralism in languages in the united states i guess because i'd love to see old white politicians butchering other languages because also like Spanish is, first of all, very ubiquitous in the United States. Like, it's pretty hard to go through life and not know a little, you know, not not at least understand the sound structures of it. It's pretty phonetic in the way it's spelled. Yeah. But like, imagine if they imagine if there was like a large like Dutch population or like, yeah, people who like speak Swahili or something and like hearing people try and <laughs> try and say those words or like trying to, yeah, trying to speak Cantonese or some shit. I mean, uh, I'm all for it. I would love to see tons of that shit. Yeah, it's really uh, interesting that uh, most like white Americans do not speak Spanish. I don't want to say most, but I, I would say a majority of white Americans do not speak Spanish, even though it is truly our second language. Yeah. And I mean, well, we, you know, decisively don't have a uh, national language, which I agree with. But also, like, if you don't speak it, don't be sure you know. Like, talk to a talk to a staffer, ask ask somebody before. You know, I was a I was a service worker for years as a like a waiter and a bartender. If you don't know what the dish is, ask the sous chef to explain it to you. I mean, get get your inf information before you just go like spouting shit out uh, in public. It's never it never works out well. Um, okay, can I can I put one in? This is something we gotta watch. Okay, okay, yeah. We don't have to watch the whole thing because it's like four minutes. Um, but let's watch a little bit of it. And what we're going to do is uh, because I do come from a um, something of a performing arts background, I thought we could do a little uh, performance review. So we're just gonna, we're gonna rate, we're gonna rate this performance. Okay. Is this Putin singing Blueberry Hill, I hope? No, I've been looking for that video. Hey Daniel writes, dear Ben, as I'm learning about ethics, I'd like to get your input on where you stand. Would you steal a piece of bread to feed your family? Would you steal a piece of bread to feed your family? Oh, God damn it. Hold on. Hold on. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. I, I do want to pause it just to give everybody. If you didn't know this video already, Ben Shapiro singing Les Mis. With, with instrumental backing. Oh, God. I can't wait. As I'm learning about ethics, I'd like to get your input on where you stand. Would you steal a piece of bread to feed your family? Would you steal a piece of bread to feed your family? Why or why not? Well, Daniel, I can really only think of one way to answer this, and it's in musical form. So I think we're going to have to do that. Out in the darkness, a few 
fugitive running, fallen from God, fallen from grace. God be my witness, I never shall yield till we meet face to face. Till we meet face to face. He knows his way in the dark. In your multitudes, scarce to be counted, filling the darkness with order and light. Okay, I think we get the the idea of it. D know that I'm going to watch the rest of this after. Um, yeah, and maybe after. just a note a note for Joe. We can send you the link to this, but uh, maybe if we could find a way to make sure we have good sound quality and actually hear some of this. Okay, so back to this. So the, again, this is Ben Shapiro was answering questions from fans, I guess. Maybe, I don't know. It's sort of structured that way. Uh, he's in what looks like a hotel room with like a shitty Rothko print behind him. I wrote down that exact note, yeah. Yeah, and he is asked if he would steal a, bre uh, a loaf of bread to feed his family, which I'm guessing is like a, I've never seen Les Mis. Uh, <coughs> but he's like, I can answer this in song. And then goes into a rendition of uh, a song from Les Mis. Uh, so, Dan, how, how would you rate, how would you rate Benny Shapino's performance? How many, how many um, Jim Eagles am I going to give it? <laughs> yeah, on the eagle scale. Oh man, what I wasn't bad. I mean, he can carry a tune. I really love the Irish brogue that came in there. The yeah. lard. <laughs> yeah, he. Uh, uh, but uh, so you know, uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, much like uh, Louis Farrakhan, uh, Ben Shapiro is a class classically trained violinist. I've seen like video of him performing. So. Wait, He's seriously? Got, like, yeah. This is the second violinist? Oh, good. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So yet another thing in common between Ben Shapiro <laughs> and Minister Louis Farrakhan. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah. man, if we could, ooh, we should, that's what I want to see in concert. I want to see like dueling fiddles <clears throat> to Farrakhan versus Ben Shapiro. Fuck debating. Yeah, narrated uh, by Cornell West. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, so he is classically trained. His sister is like a classical singer as well. Um, yeah. He can carry a tune, all right. Yeah, not bad, not bad. I think the I, what, thing what is, what rock have I been living under that I miss this? Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of classical, yeah, classical m musicianship and right wing shitheads, I guess is. Yeah. Uh, match made in heaven. Yeah, he can carry a tune. He's okay. Uh, I would rate his on um, the eagle scale out of five. I would I would give him a four out of five on his vocal quality, his singing. He's got a decent. Uh, sorry, he can carry a tune. He's got a you know he's got a decent vibrato and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, acting, ooh, uh, half eagle. Um, <laughs> really. Ben, Benny, we gotta like you're hitting the notes, but I'm not feeling I'm not feeling your emotion. Uh, yeah. Your face moves disturbingly little as you uh, make your gestures. He's you know he's trying to ham it up a little bit, but I think much like much like when I've seen video of his sister singing, um, it's hard to sing with emotion when I don't think you like have feelings. <laughs> yeah, that was. That yeah, was that's a great gut reaction, Ben. <laughs> Five yeah, that's that's Ben Shapiro trying to uh, be, you know, kind of silly. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I go low this week with my last, my last one, but this is this is gonna make me laugh, and I'll, I'll tell you how I got to this later. But um, I'll just let you read it. 
Okay, this is from the Daily Mail in the UK. Headline is, iconic Italian model Fabio Lanzoni is on the hunt for an Australian wife and reveals why he's still single at 61. <laughs> Oh, it's, oh, it's Fabio. Fab oh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the Fabio. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, he does. He looks weird. Yeah, he does look weird. He's, yeah, he, okay. Uh, still in great shape, but okay, so. <laughs> still bearing that chest. Yeah, yeah, and still shaving that chest, clearly. Uh, or waxing, some sort of wax job. Okay, so just reading into it a little bit. Italian-American model Fabio Lanzoni known around the globe as just Fabio, cashed in on his looks as a romance novel cover star throughout the 80s and 90s. And despite having, quote, good genetics, why did they quote that? Uh, quote, good genetics, as it, it's like as if they're mocking it. Uh, the 61-year-old, known for his chiseled chest and long flowing mane, told Stellar Magazine for Australian newspaper, The Sunday Telegraph, that he's single and on the hunt for an Australian wife. Quote, I love Australian women. I want to look for a wife down in Australia. They're the best. They're beautiful. And they're really nice, down to earth. That's the best combination for a woman, he said. Fabio, who has also appeared in 2001 film Zoolander and on The Bold and the Beautiful, went on to explain why he believes he's still single. <laughs> oh, God, these pictures of Fabio are just great. Uh, it's very hard to find people who are happy with themselves, and I'm very happy with myself. You need the whole combination. This is not the first time Fabio has revealed his plans on finding an Australian wife. <laughs> this is an ongoing story. It's a developing story. The, the legendary heartthrob declared on Australian breakfast program, The Morning Show on Thursday, Australian women are the best, period. <laughs> After complimenting the women of Australia, he went on to describe them as more, quote, domesticated than their American and European counterparts. Domesticated? Were the cats? And then we go on, we have a lot of chesty pictures of Fabio. Uh, quote, everyone in the world knows they are down to earth, beautiful, very domesticated. <laughs> <laughs> Doubling down. Okay. The best thing for a man. Born in Italy in 1959, Fabio started as a model and actor, blah, blah, blah. In addition to growing... Fabio has never been married. Yeah, ends on Fabio has never been married. <laughs> so we should react, uh, agree or disagree. <laughs> um, I mean, I have nothing wrong with Australian women. I guess it's a weird fetish to have. The domesticated thing is troubling. I, I didn't even actually get to that part. I just thought it was funny enough that he like... <laughs> Australian women just like judging them like that is hilarious to me well yeah domesticated is a curious word because I think of house pets when I say domesticated yeah. like did he have like American and European girlfriends who are like shitting on the rug <laughs> and and like scratching up the furniture and shit like this this is gonna sound mean but it kind of it's exactly how I imagined Fabio would be it's almost this like Italian stereotype Kind of like womanizing yeah. guy. And not, not that all Italians are like that or anything like that. It's just, he, he's given a bad name to Yeah, they're more domesticated. Like, I don't you know. know. It's a... <laughs> yeah, I need a domesticated woman. And I don't know. And also, it's, it seems like, a, I'm not sure I believe that they're more domesticated than any other women. I mean, the, uh, <laughs> the Australians are famously loud, drunk, <laughs> wild people. I'm not, sure, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure where he's getting his information on that. <laughs> Usually fit though, from uh... yeah, yeah, it's both. Uh, but well, you know, all that time fighting snakes and lizards and shit. <laughs> Can't you just hear it? Can't you just hear the? I can. The, yeah, the it's. I'm gonna it. be hearing that in my head when I go to sleep tonight. The domesticated. I love. I. I. Yeah, the domesticated thing's the best. And then I love that he said it multiple times. Yeah. And then he hasn't said. You know, it'd be one thing if he's like. And why is he still getting interviewed on anything? I. I do. It, it kind of makes me think that we should start just reading Daily Mail articles on the show a little bit more. Often. Oh. Oh, there's a there, there's a lot of gold there. Um, yeah, it really is. It is. I mean, we. Sh yeah, lowbrow UK journalism is uh, ripe for the picking at all times.
kind of equivalent uh, to where we are, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. We should maybe we should just also have a Fabio watch. Should we just kind of put up it. some put up some Google alerts for all the Australian periodicals and news stations of just any time Fabio shows up looking for a woman? <laughs> Unless you think that Fabio might have said this before the whole Me Too movement or anything. Um, then can you read the date on this? <laughs> 6th of March, 2021. Okay. A few weeks back. <laughs> yeah, glad we're getting updated info on Fabio. <laughs> who, again, looks like a hot dog. A chiseled hot dog. Um, yeah. Clearly is still, yeah, he, he's got the open chest. Clearly is still waxing his all his body hair may or may not be bleaching his anus and still being tempted into questions like what kind of woman if you could choose a woman from any country <laughs> oh my god i, I think we should i think we should contact this reporter and see if we can get them on just to discuss this like is this reporter just like following fabio is this a like an ongoing investigation yeah a domesticated australian woman that's so fucking stupid <laughs> Uh, well, that's all um, I got for this week, man. Yeah, those those are some good ones. I suppose we should uh, just before we get on the interview. I just wanted. I thought we'd be remiss if we didn't touch on it. Um, there's not. I don't think there's a ton to say, but I just wanted to, you know, put it out there that we are watching this. Um, that the uh, trial of Derek Chauvin uh, began last week. It is ongoing. I have no idea how long it'll go. Uh, these things tend to take quite a while. Um, I actually, while we were recording, I actually did get a New York Times update from this that uh, Minneapolis police, uh, the Minneapolis police chief said Derek Chauvin absolutely violated policy in George Floyd's death here. Yeah. Uh, so, and there's been a lot of that, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, there, yeah, I guess I just wanted to touch on it just to, you know, let you know that we're, it is in our minds. Um, but, everything about it is pretty fucking damning like you know one of the one of the first bombshells was that like he was actually on george floyd's neck for well, like closer to nine and a half minutes rather than eight yeah there's a yeah there's a lot of a lot of nasty stuff of like you know they still had the cuffs on him he still had his hand his knee on his neck like when like the paramedics were trying to check his pulse and shit i mean it's just it's very Again, I don't think I don't think any of it's really new. I think it's just painting a more vivid picture, right? And it's and it's a very gruesome picture. And uh, and yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Like, do you, do you have anything? Do you have anything big on it? Yeah, I just I thought it was worth mentioning what actually happened, or you know, some of the context surrounding it, um, because I think during the the protest over the summer and just kind of this like cultural process that we've been going through i can i forgot just some particulars about the case um for example it was over a counterfeit 20 dollar bill yeah and so I, I forgot what started started the altercation like i think the the shopkeeper came out and like told him to stop and george Floyd didn't stop he was going to keep going on moving on and i think there was a cop nearby or something like that Derek chauvin was nearby and yeah, they are. They're clearly trying to say that like the death happened because he had taken fentanyl and was on drugs. And yeah, I mean that was that, like he had a higher blood pressure. Yeah, rate. that that was one of the that was one of the really disgusting things from the opening argument, which you know is not surprising. Of course, like we knew they were going. We knew what the playbook uh, for this was going to be, but. Mm -hmm the uh the defense is really trying to hang its hat on this idea it's like well he was he was on drugs and uh the death was actually the result of the drugs exacerbating a heart problem and his uh adrenaline was up and that's what actually like caused his heart to give out and shit and it was like just fucking stupid and really heartless. I mean, again, it's lawyer shit. Of course, that's what it's going to be. But the long and the short of it is like, why was his adrenaline up? Yeah. Uh, so again, I just wanted to, I wanted to just mention it just so, you know, people know that we are, uh, 
we we are thinking about it. And we'll we'll you know we'll keep following the story and hopefully have some you know more people to someone that we can actually talk about the broader implications of this, what comes next, uh, what caused this, because it's outside. Of, I think, uh, again, we don't want to miss the, uh, the forest for the trees with just this isolated inc incident. Um, I think he's going to go down for it, Chauvin. Um, sure seems like My way. hope, yeah, my hope is that he gets the highest charge against him. You know, that was a big thing that they were trying to put murder three on. Yeah. <laughs> excuse me, they were trying to put mo murder three on instead of just murder two to kind of lessen the, lesser the sentence and stuff. But uh, the, it's, it's so clear. Um, it would be, it would be absolutely amazing to me if he got off. Yeah. And it, I mean, obviously I hope that again, he gets charged with the highest, um, high charge that they can pursue against him. Um, I, I do, I get a little bit weary about like some of the, the talk about like, why is there a trial at all, et cetera, and sex, right? And like, I, I totally get that feeling, but I think it's just so much stronger to to get that victory through the courts. And I mean, it's, it's a sad state of affairs when there's been so much corruption within the courts. So it seems, um, and I know I feel this way that it feels like even having the case is a, is a sham. You know, because there is that, because people have gotten off so often. I mean, to yeah. the Tamir Rice case, clearly. I mean, it's it's a joke. If, if not all of them are jokes, it's like, there's a reason this happened. It's because they're black. Yeah, and I think there's there's so much there's so much bad blood around this particular case that again, I don't I don't see there's any way that he gets off. I mean, it was a worldwide yeah. uh, movement getting or not movement, but a worldwide reaction going to this, and then like as we've just seen the chief of police, uh, other officers are all hanging him out to dry. And, you know, that I think is probably something to pay attention to once this is done is that this is going, it, the, there's a, not to fully question their motives, but kind of is that uh, had this case not gotten so much press, had there not been so much evidence and, uh, you know, so many people seen the video, would the chief of police be, you know, coming out, speaking out against him, probably the fuck not. I hope he gets convicted. I think he probably will. I think everybody understands what kind of backlash you would get if he wasn't. But um, it would be one small win in that it would open up the door that if, uh, you know, if we can convict this one guy, then we can start convicting a lot more of them as we should and start holding not just cops, uh, not just cops uh, accountable, but police unions and police precincts. And like, it's, a, it's again, it's, we're not saying anything new, but um, Derek Chauvin is not the thing. He's a thing and he should go down. I hope he does. Um, but the conversation needs to go beyond that, right? I think that's a good point to end on. Um, we need to introduce who we're speaking to this week, um, Susan Dollywall. Susan Dollywall is a climate justice advocate and also a creative. Um, we have a really interesting conversation about a D, it's kind of like decolonizing your or activism in a way, but it's I, it feels like such a buzzword to describe what we actually talk about. Yeah, we had a really great. It was a it was a really great conversation um, that you know about a world that I'm you know somewhat aware of, but not super familiar with. Of you know I'm I'm supportive of uh, climate climate activist movements, but um, we really get into more of the inner workings of them and the the problems from within these organizations, how they can get co opted, how they can get how they can get abusive, how they can be racist, how they can be sexist. So it's, yeah, it, it's a really enlightening and, and at times I think difficult conversation, but a really important one for anybody who, anybody who uh, thinks that these issues are important, you know, um, it's not, you know, it's, it, it's just showing that I think it's not, it's not so simple as just uh, this or that organization is working for climate justice. So this or that organization is, uh, you know, sterling and perfect on that note we're going to talk to suzanne stay tuned hi this is going for all seasons i'm dan i'm ben and today we're here with suzanne dollywall she is a climate justice campaigner and creative and we're going to talk a lot about that as well as the power of protest or the lack therefore of um suzanne can you give us a little bit of your background yeah um so I have been working for the last 15 years at the intersection of 
um, I guess, extractivism and indigenous rights and human rights. And that kind of morphed into um, looking at how, you know, the fossil fuels, most of the fossil fuels globally are on a lot of indigenous territories. So um, working with communities to keep those in the ground um, and, you know, to internationalize some of the climate um, justice messaging um, that involves also financial campaigning um, and also working in like the media around climate justice and, and race and representation. And I'm currently a, uh, a tutor. So I also teach um, creative strategies around the ecological crisis. This is at uh, Ecology Futures that you're a tutor at? Yeah. So I'm doing a, yeah, a module around sort of decolonizing some of the, the ways that ecological art is coming out and reflecting on the processes around that. Mm. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. Um, so the course is, uh, you know, sort of looking at really stopping and thinking about the design decisions that you make um, and how we look at ecological crisis. <coughs> And sometimes it's really illustrative, like, oh, my God, there's a problem. It's really bad. Um, and it's about stopping and really analyzing like an ecological crisis from multiple perspectives, um, holding space for conversation um, and also bringing people into the process of their own understanding around the crisis rather than just telling them what they should think. Um, and also because of the coronavirus, now we're looking at digital strategies and other ways of activism because, you know, in the Netherlands where the course is set, um, there's a curfew um, in the UK, it's, there's protest bills coming down. So it's getting harder to protest and it's not always safe for communities of color. So we're also looking at, um, yeah, what are other ways that we can engage with the crisis moving forward? I want to talk a little bit about this crackdown on protest in a little bit, um, but Suzanne, can you talk, I, I think when I met you, you were very involved in the, the Tar Sands movement. Um, can you talk about that as well as some of the other campaigns that you've worked on? Yeah, um, so I was a hippie. <laughs> um, I was doing like a philosophy degree and I was doing lots of, you know, understanding different traditional modalities of healing. And that meant, you know, being on the land and doing ceremony um, and I just had this feeling that was something was wrong with the land and this was in Canada, but I didn't know what it was. Um, and at that time, there was no awareness of the tar sands, even to Canadians and what was happening up there. Um, and then more I learned about the tar sands and the scale of it and the size of the destruction of it. It became really apparent that it was one of the, the key places, like it's a key carbon bomb. And we needed to keep those fossil fuels in the ground if we were going to avert the climate crisis. Um, so the tar sands is in northern Alberta. Uh, the size of it, if it goes to plan, would be the size of England and Wales. And it's not like conventional oil, it's heavy oil. So it's, you know, three to five times, three to five times more polluting. Um, huge amounts of water, natural gas even, so using like caviar to make spam. Um, and it's happening mainly on the territory of indigenous communities. So it's also illegal. It's violating the rights of indigenous people. Um, and so for the last, since 2009, my work has been to work with frontline communities to internationalize that within the environmental movement to make sure that the indigenous rights framework is center of that. And that also involved a lot of corporate campaigning against corporations, um, primarily BP and Shell, highlighting their involvement um, and also with banks, you know, exposing that not only are they pushing climate change, that they're investing in projects that don't have their free prior and informed consent of communities. Um, and also recently looking at insurance um, and how these projects shouldn't be underwriting, which is kind of a fast track to stop divestment. So it means, you know, if you can't get your project insured, it can't move forward. So that's been a big, that's the campaign strand of it. But then running alongside that, there's a secondary job that just comes with it, which is challenging the racism within the ecological movements themselves. 
um, you know, being a woman of color, um, I'm one of the few CEOs of an organization in that space. So you also have to suddenly become an anti-oppression trainer. You have to be an educator around colonialism. Um, so there's the whole job <laughs> that just by the nature of your identity that also comes with that as well. So that's been sort of the, the trajectory of that campaign. I want to dive in on that a little bit. Um, I know that you've published some articles like just talking about how the movement does have this, this kind of racial issue, um, maybe just voices not being heard or, you know, intentionally or not. Um, can you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, well, um, I think it's way worse in Europe and the UK and having worked on both sides of the Atlantic on that. In the UK, the environmental sector is the second least diverse sector in the whole country. So it's super systemic. Um, and I think some of that also comes from its origins of, you know, this idea of protecting pristine environments. Um, you know, conservation is often seen as removing indigenous communities from that territory. Um, and so just the, the, move, the history of that um, discipline itself has been steeped in white supremacy. And then in the US and in Canada and Turtle Island, um, you know, the last 10, 15 years has been a real shift because of the power of indigenous rights, the, the leverage and the, the language and the analysis and the resources has shifted. However, in the UK, as we don't have as explicitly, um, you know, I don't have any land rights, like, well, maybe, um, but so we don't have the same power as people of color in the UK to have shifted that dynamic. So within the UK, um, you know, there still remains you know, no resources. I don't have any resources to actually run UK Tarsons Network. Um, there is still racism on a leadership level. And the sad thing is that it also creates lateral violence. So not only are then, does it create, you know, you're challenging white supremacy because there's few resources, it challenges each other as well. Um, so it's a very systemic and endemic um, situation, which I think was just made worse by the onset of, um, you know, the popularity of folks like Greta and XR, there was this totally rewriting of climate history. It was like, oh, they just invented it. It was like, what was I doing then? Like chopping liver for the last 15 years. Um, so it's something that is, is particularly uh, acute in that movement for some reason. Just one more thing and I want Ben to get in. Can you expand on, for some reason, what you mean by for some reason and the focus on, you know, people who are white versus people of color in this movement? Yeah, I think, I mean, one thing that I found is, um, you know, when you're at leadership level, um, there's such a sort of feeling or, or understanding, a philosophical understanding that the climate crisis requires you know, a certain level of intellect, a certain level of understanding um, that you're speaking to power. So you should look like power. So that means you should look like Westminster. Um, and there's this, just the basic racism that people don't think that people of color are intellectually capable of conceiving of the crisis um, or that we don't care about it because we're so busy worried about racism. So we're worried about both, we can do both. Um, and then again, there's these images of like Jane Goodall and the people who are seen to be, and now Greta, who are seen to be environmentalists. Um, and it's also something that comes from our own communities. Like being an environmentalist is not what my dad envisioned for me. He thought I was gonna be a nanotechnologist. Um, so it's also from our communities that we haven't traditionally in the in Europe been part of that, those environmental movements. Um, and then it just continues and it perpetuates that. So it means that the resources don't go to POC leadership, um, the, the spotlight, the mic. We spend so much time fighting for the mic that then we get classed as racial campaigners, um, not necessarily as climate justice campaigners. So it's, it's those layers of racism and sexism that we see in any sector, but they get ramped up in this space also because people feel such a sense of urgency. Um, there's such a power grab. Do you feel like this changes the goals or co-ops the goals in any way? Pardon, what was that? Do you feel like this changes the goals or co-ops the goals in any ways? Yeah, I think, especially in the last few years, it's become, as it's become more popular, 
It's also become more of about being visible, about information sharing, about like, oh, we've got to wake up the masses. I was like, well, don't you think the masses are awake? Like when you hear environmental or climate organizers speaking, like how do we get them? It's like, don't you think that most of us who are seeing our families struggle with the drying up of the Himalayas, watershed that feeds our farms, we're seeing cyclones. So it sort of shifts it towards um, maintaining power rather than building a internationalized, intersectional, multi-strategic campaign. And that also is affected by the nonprofit industrial complex. So, you know, climate justice is an industry. There are funders and the funders decide the strategies and they're normally white dudes with a lot of money. So I think that's really important for people to understand who are on the outside of this, that the things that are most important aren't being taken care of. Like tar sands for a few years was super cool. So everyone was funding tar sands, but it's not cool anymore, it's fracking. And fracking gets funding. So in terms of what you're saying of the goals, the goals aren't determined by the on the ground reality. They're determined by um, the people who control the money and what's most popular, what's gonna trend like plastic straws. Um, but some of the real needs, like the humanitarian impacts of cyclones, um, adaptation strategies that are determined by communities. No one's doing that shit. Sorry, I can swear. Um, no one's you can doing that. Swear all you want. <laughs> no one, no one is working on that because it's not cool and it's not winnable. So I think that's something that we often talk about because people don't want to criticize the climate movement because sometimes you can feel really insular because you're already fighting power. Um, so yeah, that the goals are whack. <laughs> They're off key right now. And sorry, Ben, just one more question. Um, and Suzanne, you were one of the people I follow on Instagram who's really probably the only place that I've seen giving proper um, attention to this issue. And that's the, um, the protest in India by the farmers. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that's... Um super painful to talk about, um, but really important. So it's been going on for over three months um, and it's part of the movement for farmers in India to um, you know, secure fair prices. It's also connected to the indigenous rights movement in India. Um, you know, all many sectors connect and converge on this movement. And that's why it's been one of the biggest mobilizations in human history. Um, and so, you know, it's a lot of elders who have been um, at the capital for over three months. They've been holding that space. Um, it's now harvest season. So the women are staying and the men are going home to um, harvest. And yeah, I think what's been really shocking about that movement has been the lack of solidarity from the climate movement. Um, and it's this racism and this lateral violence that I've been speaking about is that, um, you know, often within the climate movement, you know, you can go to a retreat and you can spend the whole week trying to convince people that there are countries other than America. And you're like, all right, we've had a whole week. Um, and so there isn't this international um, sense of other communities. And I think a lot of that is because of the media if something's happening in the US, it clicks on. And I have a lot of love and care for those movements, but we haven't had that reciprocity go back and forward or that sustained um, media on that. And I actually got totally, I got too sad to even share it anymore. Cause I was like, what all these people who I've stood with, I've stood on your land, I've took on corporations, I put my body on the line, and you can't even share this shit on Instagram. <laughs> it's really heartbreaking. So I think we're really in a moment too where we need to reckon with, um, you know, where what activates our empathy? How do we care about other nations? And how can the largest land rights protests in human history uh, not be on our radar? So what do we mean by climate justice, really? I'm interested in this, like, because this is something that is like apparent that, you know, and I'm, I've been guilty of it, too, of it's, it, it, it can be a little bit that sometimes when a climate activist will come on um, the news or something, my eyes can glaze over a little bit by the way it's talked about. And sometimes it's because it's like, sometimes it just sounds like doomsday soothing. So I see how people sort of turn off their brain. And then there's also... Yeah, the uh, the very relevant fact that it seems like it's we're just talking about the sexiest thing this week, 
with like the plastic straws as a perfect example. Um, and I was wondering if you could, you, you already kind of touched on it, but if you could expand a little more about um, maybe where those shifts come from. I mean, is it just the benefactors who decide that this week it's, you know, uh, well, six pack beer open, or like six pack holders or something that you need to start cutting up? I mean, what, how does the, how does this, how does the news cycle switch so yeah. emphatically? <laughs> I think there's a few things. I think, you know, there's one that I mentioned, which is the funders. That's a yeah. huge one. You know, like I had a meeting with a funder last week and she was trying to get support for work and she's like, oh no, but we're not really into that right now. So literally if you don't have funding, then you don't have capacity to create campaigns, to create social media, so that's one. The other thing is that we respond to violence. Um, like why has there been such a response to, um, it has to get violent before people care, you know, and that happened with Standing Rock too, as soon as it got super violent. So I think that's one thing. Um, and then the other thing is like, who's in charge of the channels and what feels likable and what feels winnable. Um, so often, you know, even within the tar sands, pipeline fights often become really popular because it's, it's possible to stop a pipeline. However, actually stopping the tar sands at the source is so complex. And it's not dilutable into one winnable goal that it doesn't um, go through. The other thing is, you know, I've spent quite a lot of time at um, the Doc Society looking at how they select the documentaries. Um, and sometimes it literally is that they want to, this whole idea of getting the most people. So diluting the message, making it easy, not talking about race. Um, you know, we've literally had banners snatched off us and being pushed out of the front of protests if we try and talk about race. Um, so I think this idea of like this populism kind of means that it waters down um, what's happening. And also then I think with catastrophes, um, I was, I interviewed um, a documentary filmmaker actually yesterday who was talking about in his documentary, when the storm fades, he put the storm, the cyclone at the beginning so that was the, you know, but the whole story wasn't about that. It was what happens after the storm, what happens about the need to rebuild and to regenerate. So it's also the way that just narrative cycles work that we're more drawn to um, catastrophes rather than like rebuilding as well. So all of those things um, come together. And then it's this thing of what's happened with XR of that they have, just stolen the infrastructure and the narrative and they have a really doomsday, apocalyptic, simplified version of it, um, which is kind of taking up the, the noise. And XR, you mean uh, Extinction Rebellion? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'm glad that we got through them because I know you have some, some <laughs> thoughts about XR. Um, the floor is yours. Yeah, sure. Um, it's actually my least favorite topic, but I will talk about it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you know, XR, in the UK, they have a very different um, position than the rest of the world. And I think that's really important because sometimes people say, well, the XR group that I have are really nice and they're trying and it's like, but this is a brand. That's like saying the McDonald's next to me though, they give me extra ketchup and they're really nice. It's like, okay, that's cool, but what is this brand? So I think that's what we have to realize. It's a brand um, that it's, you know, where it's getting funding from, how it's accountable to communities is totally um, not transparent. You know, one of the people who was paying to expand the Heathrow airport was actually funding them. Um, and they intentionally removed folks like me, long-term climate justice organizers from the space. And the strate their strategy was to go for the normal people. Um, and so they have this group and, you know, they're very much focused on the, the scaring people, the waking people up. So when they talk, it is really scary. I'm like, whoa, I can't even deal with that. That's doom and gloom. And their analysis of protest is so if we just fill up the prisons, then eventually the state can't cope with us and the state will fall and da, da, da. it's very, it's a but mess. They're saying, they're saying fill, up the, fill up the prisons with people protesting getting, or getting arrested for protesting? Exactly. If you, and the, you know, this kind of idea of numbers. If you get enough numbers, like a hundred monkey syndrome thing, then you can create change. Yeah. So, yeah, which is like, you know, 
other movements like this protest in India, it's not just the numbers, it's the relationships and the, the connection to the ground. Um, yeah, so yeah, I've kind of, we've had, you know, we've tried very hard to change that, but the DNA of it, the, the philosophy of it is, is so embedded in a lot of that white supremacy that it's literally just removed the space for us to be climate justice organizers. Yeah, I mean, th th this is what I'm kind of talking about, I guess, when or when I begin to ask about this. It's like these are, I mean, there's 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 twofold that I get from that with the Extinction Rebellion thing, because there's first of all, like, I mean, on its face, just enough people getting arrested doesn't sound like a good, uh, that, uh, that, yeah, it doesn't sound practically sound to me. But also, yeah, the very, very doom and gloom thing, I mean, isn't it? And I know this can sound, sound, sound kind of ignorant, but isn't that kind of like getting in the way of like, if people are just annoyed by you or just hearing like this existential doomsday soup saying that's, I mean, like, I feel like that's what gets people to tune out a little bit. Yeah, I think it's like, you know, it's a cycle of grief. And there is a point where you need to see enough, like, you know, seeing the tar sands woke me up because it's like, oh my God, that's, hell on earth that's never going to be cleaned mm -hmm. up so that you do need a sense of like that scale to awaken you and but I think then it switches you off and also people who might have been switched on just from the facts you don't have to make it hyperbolic it's bad enough as it is do get switched on and also just the aesthetic like this 90s grunge which I'm a bit grunge but you know that 90, 90s aesthetic grunge of what an activist looks like what you need to do. Um, yeah, and a lot of young people of color, you know, did go into XR and went through so much racism, so much um, trauma that now, you know, I, I'm even working with someone who's writing a play about that, like how much trauma they went through. Um, so yeah, it is, I think there's a sweet spot between having enough information, not turning people off um, and also seeming, being credible. Like, you know, when I speak to Shell, I'm in a suit, I'm talking about my assets, you know, there's, these, these different personas of ways that we can do that work. Um, so yeah, so I think it's definitely, and that's why I look so much at cultures of activism um, because there can be this assumption, well, that's the only thing that's existed. And there's a generation now like Gen Z, is that what it is? The only thing that XR is um, climate activism. So I try and do a lot of movement um, education as well around our ancestors like Ken Sarawiwa and other movements and even the work I've done um, so people understand that there are other ways and other cultures of, of climate organizing that exist so it's not just this this one yeah is there is there a culture of like oh you're a poser if you're not you know wearing the grunge uniform or something like, like that like is there an element of that yeah, I think there is. I mean, especially I was in Oxford. I was in groups called like Climate Camp and Reclaim the Power. And it was very much so you, you got to be a vegan, you got to be polyamorous, you got to like <laughs> do oh, no. It was fun, but you know, like <laughs> you can't, it's it's very much, you know, even if I had night trainers, that was too much. Um, so obviously I resisted against that. So it does create these like barriers and these perceptions and especially with people of color, you know, like especially immigrants, many of mm -hmm. us, like our parents worked hard for us to get those Nikes. Um, so, you know, being in that, being more in those contradictions that you can be part of this world and you're still trying to challenge it. Um, but then that literally comes down to like them not being used to white, uh, non-white folks or even working class folks. So that's the thing, it's not even just a, a race thing it was it's also a class thing that it's a super middle class yeah it's so I, I, sort of ironically self-defeating that something that is supposed to be sort of this counterculture movement that's supposed to accept you know all comers and uh and you would think that all of those things of veganism or polyamory or something would kind of be uh, a little more welcoming especially the polyamory i guess uh but it's odd. I, I, I find it odd in protest movements and, and like, you know, it, this happens in everything, every facet of life, but that you paint yourself into a corner by saying, no, this is what this looks like. And it doesn't look like this. Yeah, definitely. And that's why um, not even by choice, but because I've been so vocal about 
racism, um, and also sexual violence. There's a lot of unchecked sexual violence in the movements, and that stops people accessing resources. Um, and there's this scary thing right now that's like cancel, cancel culture. So if you do come forward as a survivor, then people will say, well, you're canceling that person. It's like, no, this person's dangerous. And I'm worried this person is going to offend again. Um, so that's that's a little bit the scary edge of where this kind of dogmatism goes. Um, and I think that's something we don't talk about. And it's the reason why mainly now I work in the art space because the climate spaces are literally not safe for me. Um, and there are no accountability structures. Can't go to a HR department. There's no, and if you, we're supposed to be opposing, uh, you know, abolition culture. So you can't also then involve the police. So a lot of survivors like myself are left in this gray zone where, um, there's no accountability, there's nowhere to go. And that's why I've been working mainly in the art spaces to think about, okay, well, what are the new ways that I can continue to do this work? How can I shift the culture and create a new, um, even if it's a small space where we do talk about accountability and where we do find other ways to do this work. Suzanne, um, could you tell us about your, your kind of light bulb moment that got you involved with activism? Um, that's so interesting because I don't actually call myself an activist. Um, I've just always been like this. <laughs> I like, even when I was like seven, I remember making all the kids in my class do like a 48 hour famine and <laughs> for uh, to raise money. Um, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I actually had a light bulb moment the other day, um, thinking about Sikhism and thinking about the farmers' protests. And part of Sikhism, um, which is the religion I'm part of, is that you fight for justice. Like literally, that is our religion. And we see that as seva. And so, you know, what's happening in India, it's not activism. That is like practicing our religion, that we fight for justice. And when, you know, what we call intersectionality or like, oh, we should work between races. It's not even a concept. It's like, you know, there, um, even though there were Muslim um, attacks on Sikh people at the farmers protests, the Sikh elders are protecting the Muslims so they can pray at the protests. Like it's that level of um, seva. So for me, this is like, it's spiritual work. Like when I started working on the tar sands, I couldn't have conceived of those strategies or done those actions. Like obviously there was a rational analysis of the oil situation and the economy, but like I've never been arrested. Um, and the things that I've done have been through, through spirit and through that collaboration with those forces. So even what we call um, activism, um, it's more about like, yeah, that, that leveling up and, and being in service of life. I want to pull it back to XR um, again and kind of talk about like this, this, I guess, extinction of people of color within that movement. Mm -hmm. And I guess maybe some of the trauma that goes into that. And I think that like we are having a reassessment in culture about like what trauma, what, what defines trauma. And it can be, it doesn't have to be something so major. It, it could feel minor at the time and then become major later in your life. Um, do you, are you open to talking about any anything that actually happened? With what, sorry, with specifically around? Yeah, I guess just maybe some things that you saw that really turned you away from that movement. Um, if you yeah, were yeah and I mean, this is heavy, but like, I think the biggest thing for me was the sexual violence mm -hmm. and the lack of accountability. And to be honest, you know, like fighting white supremacy, I feel like white people are gonna be white people and it's just part of, the work and you know who's going to be an ally you know who's going to step up and who's going to be with you but it's this thing that i was talking about lateral violence is the violence between people of color within the movement um and that's kind of a response to white supremacy um, but it's also something that's healing there so for me it was constantly um calling in these uh, this abuser and being ignored and trying to still do the work and slowly my resources being taken away. 
So there was this, you know, XR coming in and we're losing resources there. And on top of that, within my own community, um, that there wasn't an attempt to address this because this person controlled resources and this person controlled media. And so for me, that's been the hardest thing. Like I am, I'm down with talking to white people about racism. I can like, you know, switch people around. I can work with totally different classes. But what has um, worn me down has been that. And also the things that we're willing to do e to each other to access media. Um, that's been shocking because <laughs> it's not even like big ass media. It's not like you're going on the Kardashians. You're going on a podcast that maybe has a hundred thousand likes or something. And what's happened is this this need to become like eco celebrities and to climb into that has made us turn on each other. Um, and so that's what's worn me down, to be honest. Like it's not been fighting Shell. It's not been fighting BP. It's been um, the lack of accountability community and not being believed say by folks in Canada and US when I've been like yo XR is messed up stop working with them do you know what's happening to us I can't hold the ground for you anymore and that not being heard so that lack of international care people not caring about the farmers protests that's what's actually broke my heart um in this movement and that's what we need to heal. And that's what we need spaces for. But we're so um, bogged down with dealing with the, the white supremacy in the movement that we don't have spaces to heal between us. We don't have a moment to rehabilitate or find accountability for survivors. Um, and there's not enough um, international consciousness. Like, And I think the, the win of Biden was a real moment of that too and it was one thing to celebrate Trump getting out but to see people celebrating Biden when we knew that that foreign policy meant death <laughs> in the Middle East what it meant for us that was what really just got me I'm like wow I've been throwing down for community and where's the reciprocity where's this international um, awareness so that's what I'm kind of like trying to yeah, wrestle with at the moment. I, I have one more question um, before I want Ben to get back in here. Um, I, I know we talked about echo celebrities and the the idea of like Jane Goodall or Greta um, or XR for that matter. Um, can you talk about that on, if, if you've seen that on a personal level and the effect of that? Yeah, I think um, definitely. Um, like I mentioned, it's like, you know, I sort of took um, a lot of jobs doing like content production and digital production so that I could try and change the narrative. So I could try and slip in international context, um, working on different podcasts, some of them that are quite well known. Um, and in that space, then you went up again to like, oh, but that's not, that's not cool enough. That's not, <laughs> you know, that's not gonna get enough likes. So you're constantly coming up against that. Um, and then again, you know, within those spaces, I've gone through um, labor rights abuses and racism and called on people for support for that. And again, people turning an eye because they want to continue to have access to it. So I find it so shocking because like, yeah, like, you know, like I said, not to be rude, but it's like, this is like d list celebrity. It's not even real celebrity. What are you doing? Um, She's talking about our show, but yes. <laughs> no, I, yeah. This is like... Yeah. This is a state of the art. Um, so, and I did a, a research fellowship on this actually last year, uh, looking at how um, this, this need for eco celebrity, the way that the channels are being produced, and how it's turning in, it has created and deepened this white supremacy and this lateral violence. It's also shifted who has been seen as the experts. Also, on an intergenerational level, like, I feel like I'm past it now because I'm not, like, Gen Z and I don't have, like, so many followers. So it also means that we're losing the elders and um, the the deep strategies and the deep histories from that as well. Um, so, yeah, so it has been, like, I literally have had to cut myself off completely from everyone I know in that space because I haven't had a single person who has stood up for my labour rights um, the safety of my body and that's why now I'm like literally out on an island trying to figure out new ways forward 
um, because it's assumed that you will just take it for the for the climate movement. Um, and I'm trying to support other other folks, other um, survivors to try and you know draw that draw that line there. Um, but yeah, it's something we really need to think about. Like, what do we get in the media for? What are we willing to do to get it? Um, and also, why aren't we believing? And how do we protect survivors? Well, I'd, I'd love to hear about you. You talked about uh, working with, like, working in the arts now to uh, to combat and make these changes. Is there anything um, specific that you're working on? Any projects or <clears throat> suspicious? Uh, yeah, sorry. Are there any specific projects that you'd want to talk about of how you're telling these stories or how you're trying to uh, change this conversation, change this culture? Yeah, totally. It's like. I'm saying the same things that I used to say in the climate movement, but people in the art world are like listening. <laughs> um, and that's been the main thing. It's like, I still have a platform to talk about climate change and culture shifts. And I think it's because with, I talk about it as um, the form, the form of the protest. So within the art world, there's more willingness to, to have those conversations. So lots of speaking um, and then doing the module. And I'm also trying to um, write and try and write about, um, at the moment, actually, it's more about biophilia and bionosis, which is the, um, you know, the love of nature and the knowledge that comes from being in that loving relationship with nature. Um, and for me, I think that's the source of this work because that's how I got into the tar sand stuff at the beginning. And it's like, okay, I gotta go back to the source, go back to the water, go back to the land. What is the land telling us to do at this point? So that's kind of um, a part that I'm doing that. I've also worked with a few um, Hollywood um, producers who are writing a TV show about the, the climate in the future, um, an Apple TV show. So working with those writing tables to think about the, the decolonial aspects of that. Um, yeah, and bringing a, a right space to it. Great. I wanted to get back to um, the, the protest bills that are going on right now, and specifically in the UK. Um, ben is in the UK. Suzanne, I know you have a relationship with the UK as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that protest bill and maybe some of the other anti-protest movements you've seen going on recently? Yeah. I think I was thinking about this before we got on and I think it's something that's always happening. There's always this resistance, escalation of policing. I think it's been exasperated by the pandemic. So what's happening in the UK is that, um, you know, they're using the pandemic as a way to lock down on protests. So, you know, there's curfews now. Um, even one person doing a protest is illegal, which is crazy. Um, and so what's happening is that there were protests in response to that and to a woman who was killed by the police. Um, and so this bill has actually been stopped um, at the moment, but there is ongoing resistance to, to keeping it out. Um, but I think it's really important to note that um, yeah, while protesting is really, really, really important, we have to think about making sure that this movement is also looking at the other powers of policing and immigration as well. So yeah, it, that bill is going back into um, Parliament soon. And part of that as well is also a bill which would um, allow police who are undercover to commit crimes and not be held accountable as well. So it's just a slippery slope towards fascism. Um, and that's what we saw in India too, you know, under Modi, um, there were 300 protesters who died in those protesters. And some of that were, who were kept in um, under surveillance or died in police um, custody as well. So yeah, I think definitely the pandemic has increased this authoritarianism and the other thing that we're dealing that we're dealing with in the UK is with Brexit is the most, you know, insane, unhumanitarian laws against asylum seekers as well. So it's mm -hmm. it's this kind of clamping down on everything and using Brexit and the, the pandemic as the as the excuse for it. This is one thing I, I mentioned to Ben in the pre-show. Um there's been a lot of attention paid um paid to at the border between Mexico and the United States and treatment of um refugees there, um, but there doesn't seem to be the same kind of focus uh, in Europe. And I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about that, um, just the difference, I guess. Yeah, I think 
that's going to sound lame, but so much of it is just from the media and what is, um, what's considered cool, what gets trended, what gets on there, and this US imperialism within movements itself that, um, you know, people don't even know that the biggest thing that we're dealing with in the UK, for instance, is like air pollution for black and brown communities, um, or that Brexit even happened. <laughs> people don't even know that Brexit happened. You know, I had to move countries to stay with my partner because of that. Um, the refugee camps that have been, you know, recently, um, you know, increased crackdowns there, coronavirus, all of those things there. So I think it's the US imperialism of activism. And it's a real question that people need to ask themselves about, you know, do you just rely on social media to activate your care? What are your relationships? What are the news sources that you're digesting? What is your awareness of foreign policy, especially US foreign policy, that you even understand the implications of your government of what's happening there? Um, and we literally just don't have the same, um, also NGO infrastructure and the NGOs here, like I know in the U US, often they'll lend a hand and amplify those situations. So we also need more like citizen journalship relationships with journalism um, where we're activated from that. But I think it's just something really people need to ask themselves, like why are um, those bodies not as important? And the other thing, the last thing is this perception of Europe. Like I know when I went to Canada and the goth kids were like, what, you're brown and you have an English accent? It's like, yeah, dude, there's brown people in England. Hello, brown people. So I think there's also this colonial imagination of what Europe is and people don't actually know how many people of color are there, what the movements are, how the migration from um, different communities because of US foreign policy has brought people to those camps. So there's also a need to like, I don't know, what is the word for undoing US imperialism in your mind? Um, <laughs> whatever that is. So that there's a need to do that and, and to build relationship. And you mentioned we would when we were chatting, you know, I was thinking about Kate, um, not Kate, Meghan Markle. And I was mm -hmm. like, how did she go to the England? Did she not speak to one black or mixed race person and say, what's it like to live in England as a black or brown person? <laughs> to not know that reality. Well, according, according to her interview, <laughs> she did no research nor on the, uh, on what the royal family was either, apparently. Yeah. And no shade at Meghan. Yeah, I'm sure she said it was time, but it's just that sort of thinking, you know, like, do people know what that reality is for black and brown folks in Europe? Mm -hmm. I guess because uh, you, you coming from England or you grew up in England, correct? Yeah, yeah, this is something I've noticed being over here. And, you know, as someone who is, you know, I'm very politically conspiratorial and very active and loud mouthed about it and stuff. And I, I've, I've something that I find interesting about the culture here, even from like a leftist culture over here, the people who are presumably uh, progressive is, and I really see it with um, stuff like the policing bill is there seems to be a sort of, I don't know, I guess like an activist lethargy with people speaking up, people having you know, even people who I, friends of mine who are very progressive and seem to uh, align with me politically, they're, you know, they'll, they'll have uh, this or that to say about any given uh, subject, but it always kind of winds back to, well, it's fucked. Um, and it kind of just ends there. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on that of like what that culture is specifically in the UK. I mean, obviously that really extends to, um, to racism in the UK and I think broader racism in um, Europe. I know Dan and I have seen this in our travels as well of, you know, uh, like people in France or Italy will love to talk about how racist America is. And it's like, well, you guys throw bananas at black soccer players and stuff. So I don't know if you really have ground to stand on and that sort of thing. And I, I wonder, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. And mm. Yeah, I mean, just what you, Oh, sorry. yeah, go, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I think because I, I, I grew up in England, but um, I moved to Canada when I was about 11. Mm -hmm. So I had this kind of twinned experience of like, you know, the UK and what that meant and being just used to being called racist names all the time and then going to like really hick town in Canada and experiencing mm -hmm. racism there and then going to Toronto and that that liberal space 
And so when I came back to the UK in 2009, I'd had this experience of being in Canada, of being able to be proudly Sikh, of being, you know, like, oh, I can be cute even if I'm brown. Like literally that's how racist the UK was. So I think when I came back to the UK, I had this different kind of attitude of like, entitlement and maybe privilege because I'd gone through that, um, you know, Canadian university culture. And I think that's what gave me a kind of ability to be like, fuck it. And like that anarchism, but this is how we're gonna, how we're gonna take it over. These are the strategies and that entitlement to challenge white power. Um, but like I said, you know, I, I got worn down by um, exactly what you're saying. This kind of, if you question racism in the UK, it's like, why are you questioning it? You will be gaslit until you question your own mental health, till you're pushed to, to so suicidal ideation. All of those things um, happen. And so, you know, that's why when Brexit hit, I actually left um, because I was just like, if I'm going to have impact on a global scale and be accountable to the communities that I'm accountable to, I need to be somewhere else. And obviously the Netherlands was racist and, you know, I'm sure there's racism here too. So I think... Um, what's happening is that, and this report that just came out, the report just came out about race, that the UK is not racist. Yeah, there's a, the, yeah, for, for anybody who hasn't been following the uh, Downing Street just did a, uh, well, they did it, you know, in a very kind of fascistic sense, uh, did a study of themselves <laughs> and have declared that there is no systemic racism within their ranks or within their government, which is, you know, laughable for many reasons, especially yeah. that that's not true anywhere on earth. Uh. Yeah, and it's it's totally part of that UK culture. Like I just went through with a major documentary organization, went through some really hairy racism, called for an inquiry. The inquiry was done by a black man. And he said that there was no racism, but the superstructures are racist. And it was like, what? What the <laughs> like, fuck does that mean? Exactly. <laughs> so when this report came out, I was really like, oh my God, this is that same thing that they did to me. And so now when people are saying what it's doing is putting people into this binary of the only thing that the conversation is not going forward enough because you're just stuck in this back and forth of, are we racist? Are we not racist? When actually we should be talking about reparations about um, you know the deaths from COVID that have been disproportionately put on UK um, black and brown folks so yeah I think there is this sense of um, just exhaustion and fatigue from that but it's a very cyclical gaslighting um, and so that mental exhaustion is really difficult and I can imagine you know like Everyone can't leave the UK right now. They can't even go on holiday. And probably sometimes what they want is just a break from that gaslighting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. We all just want to go to Megaloof. <laughs> I don't. Wait, what is this? Megaloof? It's like one of those shitty party islands that like men in their early 20s go to <laughs> uh, get alcohol poisoning. <laughs> it's in Spain. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of the one of the islands of Spain, I think. Yeah, so no one can go there, so they're having to uh, <laughs> deal with that. Um, but yeah, and I think it it does require. That's why it comes back to this like internationalization of the of solidarity of working across that. You know, I think if more, you know, the, I think the UK diaspora communities, we've really been seeing like our elders, like old folks, holding it down in India. And like, I think that's been really inspiring and really, it's like a lesson, you know, cause people think, oh, we're in UK and we're so advanced in our protesting. And meanwhile, these elders are like killing it. So that's why I think that's a way to keep your, your rejuvenation, your understanding, understand like, you know, you asked me, well, what is activism and what's the root of it? I'm like, it's connected to my Sikhism. So literally like, praying right now getting that guidance like yo i'm ready what's my next mission let's go like there that taking that nourishment from your own traditions from your own understandings looking at your diaspora communities what's happening there i think that internationalism even if we can't travel but we can access through that we can build uh, you know invite people to zoom spaces like this to talk about the different strategies that are happening there and that's a decolonization to think that 
us from you know Canada, UK, US have something to learn um, from these other places um, is really really vital to getting ourselves out of this this moment and building those relationships. I want to hear you about your next move in a minute, but I want to get your opinion on Biden and maybe some people in power. <laughs> in the, in the she's, US. she's visibly groaning, just so everyone, <laughs> yeah, yeah. everyone knows. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I kind of mentioned it before with Biden, like watching that election on the internet was freaky. Watching people that you've shared movement space with, like I said, acting like this was a savior moment. And like I said, obviously we need to get Trump out. Obviously he's a fascist. Obviously this is the lesser of two evils, but the tone deafness on what this meant for other people, what this meant for um, those kids who are still in the freaking cages. They're mm-hmm. stuck pods. in cages. Pods. Right. Yeah, they're, they're, pod, they're pods now. They're not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pods. Um, so that's that's what's been I think really sickening about that obviously them in power but it's the movements and the lack of that international sense of what this means um, being and it's that kind of campaigning mentality it's like we gotta win we won it's like what the fuck did you win you won like another round of that so Obviously, the people that are close to the White House who are holding them accountable, that's great. And I think that's great that they're doing that work. But I think on a social movements level, on an international grassroots level, um, that US imperialism is pretty, pretty shocking. And so well, Trump maybe is out, but all of the psychotic stuff that the US does globally, not only is it not stopped, it's actually going to ramp up if we think about what's happening in Palestine. So that's, that's, you know, my thoughts with that are more about, it's really shocked me to the core about what are the future of movements and who can I actually um, organize with going into the future? What does that um, movement look like? I guess that's what we've, uh, go ahead. Yeah, we've, we've talked about this a lot on the show, obviously. And I think, uh, and I think this has been, um, I think that was that was less surprising to me while it was going on, like while the election was going on. It's like, OK, sure, get Trump out, you know, whatever. And then once the election happened, it was like, OK, have a party for a weekend and then get back to work. But one thing that's been really shocking to me is like is like no one's allowed to talk about it even now. No one's like. Like, that's the thing, it, like, I, I feel like I'm going fucking crazy sometimes when people are like, they're like, well, you can't, you can't question Biden. It was like, no, you, do, when did you like him actually? But we all just need to put our heads in the sand and pretend that this is great. I think it's an extension of this council council culture and this mm. toxic positivity. And for me, the same people who won't let you speak about Biden are the same people who are protecting the abusers in the movement. That's what I've been going through. It's the same people who have been like, you can't, you can't speak bad of people, then you, you're not being um, nice enough to him or you don't have enough awareness of that. So I think that's the core of what is happening with movements is this cancel cancel culture. That means that we can't have an opposing opinion. We can't critique movements. And that's why I work in the artistic space and a philosophical space. It's like, we need to critique movements. We need to look at them at every side, tear them apart. Um, and that's what's not healthy. Um, and also it doesn't leave room for um, holding that rage or that, um, you know, that inhumanity that many of us experience. Like I just went offline, like even to party for a weekend was like, wow, you know that we're watching, you know that, do you have Palestinian friends? Do you have people, do you know what this means? And I think that was when it was just that, that US imperialism within the movement mm-hmm. embedding itself. Um, so I think if what we need to look at is we need to look at um, this toxic positivity, the space of, of actually having rooms that it's not canceling. <laughs> so, I mean, some people need yeah. to be canceled. Uh, um, but um, yeah, having more spaces for um, humility and, and hearing those other sides of it um, as well. And I think what I term that phrase is, I think of it as recentering. 
So you need to be constantly recentering your movements. Like I'm constantly being, you know, I might be queer, but I'm not trans. So I need to constantly be hearing from my trans siblings about how I'm fucking up. I'm like, oh shit, I fucked up, change myself. And it's that humility that's needed. That seems to go back to to me the eco celeb thing, uh, or that that's what that made me think of. With you know, because obviously politicians are celebrities in their own right, and I think that's a big thing you see, especially from the Democratic Party in the United States, is that there's all these fucking old people who refuse to retire because there's this idea that. The, this movement's happening, but not only does this movement need to happen or Trump needs to get out, but it needs to be me that does it. And like, would you say that's where that, the problems with like XR and different parts of the climate movement would happen of like, it's not enough that this is happening. I need to be the savior who's doing it. And that's how you get these people who are sort of untouchable. Yeah, totally, totally. And that's why the predators aren't being called out. That's why someone doesn't want to call out a predator. Um, and it's also how we write movement history and, I and we're writing it as we go. Um, and that's why certain people get written out. Um, and that has consequences insofar as like who gets resources, like all the stuff that I've done, most of the people don't even know that I've done that shit because I was behind the scenes. And then I started to realize I actually need to tell the story of what I've done so other people know. Um, but there's this constant tension because you can lose yourself, you can lose your accountability, um, you can use your strategy. I think that's the main thing is if you lose your strategy um, and also your theory of change. So if you think that the goal is to be in proximity to white power and to nozzle up to it, you know, we see that in entertainment, how much do you water yourself down? And I think obviously there's being strategic and being embedded in those spaces, but how much you're, you're willing to, um, yeah, give that up. So I think, and, and it's literally been like in the last two years that um, it's gone to this, this toxic level. And that was kind of what I was looking at my research with. And there's, there's life and death consequences of that because, you know, with the, the cyclones, you know, last May, there was a massive cyclone, Cyclone Ampham, impacted 10 million people. No one fucking shared that, not a single meme, no one from the movement, nothing. And it was psychotic. And it was like, because it's not cool, it's Bangladesh. So literally this, um, this, this culture, how we latch on, what we don't latch on to, who has the resources, who's been, it has life and death consequences um, for that wider activation of our movements to respond to crisis as well as um, that. So that's why I talk about that a lot <laughs> um, and, and do try and do it from a creative standpoint too, because when you're challenging movements like this, you obviously get blacklisted and people just think you're a troublemaker within the troublemakers. Um, so talking about it from a strategic creative level of what we need, what we need next, where we need to go um, helps that. But we, you know, we also need to talk about the difficulties um, and the problems with the movements. Um, and that's what, there's no space to do that. <laughs> Can you give us a, um, an idea of like what, if we were to take a class with you, what that would look like? and how you go about dismantling and looking at movements from that level. Yeah, um, so the first stage um, is looking at your own power and privilege and doing that process of self-reflection, of you know, thinking about the, um, the access to power, the institutions that you interact with, and not in a way that you're like, oh, now feel bad about yourself for being middle-class, and but in a way that you, unlock your power and start understanding how that affects your creative decisions and the design decisions that you make. So, you know, we do a lot of journaling, we do a lot of self-reflection, we do a lot of like dialogue work, um, and then a lot of looking at some of the past creative decisions that you've made and design decisions that you've made, and then developing works and looking at those works and how those works have barriers to um, participation, or how they leave people out and then coming up with creative solutions for bringing more people into the conversation. And then also having that space to look at, you know, we were looking at say, um, you know, someone was looking at masks and, and pollution. And, you know, from the beginning, you can be like, oh, masks and pollution is bad. And then doing like phenomenological mapping, looking at all of the viewpoints, what are all of the viewpoints about this? 
And I think that's a way to um, challenge yourself, look at your own health beliefs, um, think about before you design something, are you holding all of the opinions? And also looking at what's already been done. I think the big thing with creativity and activism is it doesn't have to always be something new. And that's part of that ego challenge. You know, it's like maybe actually you need to be in service and you're helping something or you're bringing your skills to something. You don't need to make some crazy app. Um, so there's also that part of relationship building of situating yourself in a movement, understanding what's already happened. Um, so yeah, that's kind of this, this process. So even if the outputs aren't super shiny, it's more about you know, having that conversation with yourself, seeing how you make design decisions, questioning them, and then coming to this space of understanding you can make different decisions that can change the, the way your works or your, um, yeah, sit within a movement as well, which has been really fun, especially when you see people like go through massive changes and also realize that not all activism has to be like shutting down a refinery. It can be like bringing people in your neighborhood to understand what's happening with the trees around you. And there's also a softening um, that happens as well with people, which has been really cool. I have one more question, but Ben, I wanted to see if you had anything. No, I love it. That's great. Um, Suzanne, um, as we look toward the future, what do you have on your agenda? Me? Well, um, I'm going to take some time. <laughs> I had a career, I think I worked the hardest I've ever worked in the pandemic. Um, so I'm finishing up this module and then I'm gonna start, I'm gonna do some writing. Um, I'm looking at creating some anthrotypes, which are a photography process where you use the sun and different um, non-chemical materials like beetroot and berries to um, make some prints and put that with some writing. So yeah, really have some time to heal, heal from a lot of the trauma, say goodbye and grieve a lot of the relationships that I've had to let go of. Um, and also really connect to the community here. Like the community here has such a, um, people don't even call it environmentalism, but like this love of nature, this knowing that the wind has changed, knowing that the worms they used to get aren't there anymore. So like connecting to how, what the climate crisis means on, on this island. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Trying to also continue the Notar Sands work. So trying to find ways, despite all of the effery, try and find ways to, to fund that and keep that going. Um, and the last piece, which is about what I've mentioned about the, the cyclone, you know, every time a cyclone happens like that, I can't just be like on my Instagram, like a crazy person. Um, like how do we build infrastructure for humanitarian, empathetic media responses? So I'm trying to look for um, ways to build some kind of, um, yeah, way to, um, build up that work of um, responsive humanitarian work. I don't know how, but I'll find a way. <laughs> On that note, Suzanne, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. It's been great. <laughs>